This is Jocko Podcast number 294 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. Flight. This is Blue Star 6, RP. Major Bunting announced as he crossed the release point on the ground, indicating two minutes flight time to the landing zone. With that announcement, Charlie gunships from crossbows began a slow dive toward the landing zone, prepared to release some of the 14 2.75-inch rockets that each aircraft carried along with their machine guns if it became necessary. Flight. Lead is taking fire. Blue Star 6 announced over the UHF frequency, which was obvious to everyone behind him as the green tracers were coming from all around him. Chalk 2 is taking fire. We're hit, came the next announcement. Suddenly the radio was alive with every aircraft reporting taking fire as they crossed the RP and the woods around the landing zone were highlighted by red and white flashes and green tracers streaming upward. As each aircraft flew into the cone of fire, attempting to reach the landing zone and discharge their load, the airwaves became garbled as pilots stepped on each other's transmission or, in panic, depressed their transmit switch to the entire f- flight so they could everyone could hear the conversation between a pilot and his crew. Chalk 6 is taking. Shit, get on your guns. Chalk 5, where's the damn guns? Break, break. Chalk 10 is... There was so much confusion that no one could get a complete sentence transmitted until Mayday, Mayday, Dutch Master 4-1 is going down, said Captain Fox in almost a calm voice. Who the hell is Dutch Master 4-1, someone asked over the radio. Looking skyward and searching, everyone had their answer. Dutch Master 4-1 was the command and control aircraft for the CAV screen and was entering an auto rotation from 4,000 feet. What really held everyone's attention was the flames coming out of the bottom of the aircraft. Oh shit. It was obvious that he'd taken a hit with an explosive round in the fuel cell, but at 4,000 feet, every aircraft had at least one set of eyes tracking this crippled aircraft. An aircraft in flight on fire was somehow something few had ever seen before, and it was horrifying and mesmerizing. Mayday, Dutch Master 4-1 is on fire, was the next call from Captain Fox, his voice a bit elevated. Fire was every aviator's worst nightmare. Shoot me, but don't let me burn. It was a fear that had been with aviators since Orville and Wilbur had first flown. Before parachutes, World War I pilots were known to use their pistols rather than burn in an aircraft. As everyone watched, the radios went silent. Slowly, Dutch Master 4-1 began a slow roll, and as it hit the trees, it was inverted. The CAV screen began to converge on the crash site. As Major Bunting, Bunting entered the cauldron of enemy fire, he turned to Mr. Grossman. Get on the controls with me in case I'm hit. Grossman immediately did, so that with a very light touch, ready to take command of the aircraft. Suddenly, Sauer and Thomas opened fire. Taking fire, they both screamed together, though there was no need since the sound of a hammer tapping on the side of the aircraft could clearly be heard as Blue Star 6 continued to press toward the landing zone, decelerating and coming to a hover. The Arvin soldiers didn't wait for the aircraft to land. They started jumping out as the aircraft came to a slow walk. Before Major Bunting could land, the aircraft was empty. Sir, go, go, we're empty, Sauer yelled as he continued to fire his weapon at the tree line. Chalk one on the go, Major Bunting transmitted, LZ is hot. His next transmission followed almost immediately. Mayday, mayday, Blue Star 6 is going in. He had just cleared the landing zone when the aircraft engine quit. And that right there is an excerpt from book three from a series of books called Undaunted Valor, which were written by Colonel Matt Jackson. And this is the third book of the series, which is sub- subtitled Lamb Song 719. And the first book that he wrote in this series was subtitled An Assault Helicopter Squadron in Vietnam, 1969 to 1970. And we had the honor of covering that book 
with Colonel Jackson on this podcast. It was podcast number 275. And that first book is based on Colonel Jackson's experiences himself as in Vietnam as a Huey pilot. The Huey, the iconic helicopter of the Vietnam War. And that first book, it's written as a novel or a story with the main character. The main character is named Dan Corey, but that character is based on Colonel Jackson and the events that are in the book took place. And this third book is written in a similar way. It's written from the from the perspective or focused on a, a, an individual named Dan Corey, but the the events that are written about in this third book, they took place. And it continues to recount some of these incredible heroics from these helicopter pilots and helicopter crews in Vietnam. And this third book in the series tells the story of a, of a massive operation, which included the largest helicopter assault of the Vietnam War. This is an operation that lasted 45 days. It was cut, conducted in Laos, and it was an attempt to shut down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And this book, Undaunted Valor, Lam Son 719, is filled with incredible details that Colonel Jackson got by interviewing and doing intense research to accurately describe what happened. And the book is an incredible read, but we're actually not going to read the book much today. We're going to touch on it a little bit because we have the honor of having one of the pilots who also flew Hueys in Vietnam and who flew missions in support of Operation Lam Son 719. His name is Jay Tate. He's a retired major, U.S. Army. He is the recipient of two distinguished flying crosses, 38 air medals, recognizing 950 hours of combat flying, the Bronze Star, the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry, and the Silver Star for his heroic actions under fire. It is an honor, honor to have him here with us tonight. Jay, thank you for joining us. Well, well that introduction was uh, put me right back in the cockpit. <sighs> the, the, and that book is filled with those, <laughs> those either coming into landing zones or c- coming out of landing zones. It's just incredible to read and incredible to learn about the history of that operation. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a, a friend of mine that was in um, that was in in Sog in Vietnam, and I mentioned that you were coming on the podcast, and I told him that you flew in Lam Son seven nineteen, and the look on his face is, "Ooh, that was a that was a rough one." <laughs> you know, uh, um, we supported Command and Control North, which was the northern segment of SOG in in Vietnam, and. Uh, I remember several missions that we flew prior to the kickoff of Lamson 719 on 8 February. Prior to that, we were flying out of the Quan Tri Dong Ha area with a group of Command and Control North guys from up there, flying uh, west towards Quezon, when all of a sudden our flight of four, we saw these orange fireballs coming up at us. And we immediately took evasive action. 23 millimeter anti-aircraft fire coming up at us. We took action to get out of there. Obviously, the mission at that moment was called off, and we made it back to Dong Ha. One of the guys uh, over-torqued his aircraft uh, in the evasive action. And uh, it had to be uh, grounded for inspection for tail rotor make sure that nothing had happened that would cause him further damage or even crashing. But uh, that was in January of 71, before the kickoff of 8 February 71. Uh, Well, before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about the beginning of of J. Tate. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you come from? I grew up in a little town called Hickory, North Carolina. I was born in Pensacola. My father was a flying chief in the Navy, flew PBYs. 
His, he was in charge of a hangar at Pensacola that repaired the skin on PBYs that were shot up. And uh, Dad would take him up and fly what we call the idiot circle around the <laughs> airfield and land it and check to make sure the rivets were holding okay on the aircraft. So he was an enlisted chief and he was a pilot chief. in the Navy. Yep. Oh, that's yep. pretty neat. He had a background in, uh, in aviation, uh, well, not an aviation metalsmith, but in he was, he was a metalsmith himself and did a lot of work with sheet metal and stuff like that. So obviously it was, uh, it was a skill that the Navy needed, and uh, Dad was a real smart guy and picked up on it and uh, loved uh, flying and got his wings. I remember his wings were – had a gold center with the uh, silver wings, which was different than the air, regular aviator who has all silver wings in the navy or gold, gold wings in yeah. the navy. Yeah, yeah. So uh, he was he was kind of uh, disappointed I didn't go in the navy, but when I went into Army aviation, uh, that sort of smoothed it over for him. How, how long did he do in the navy? Uh, he was just a guy that went in in 1942 after Pearl Harbor mm-hmm. and uh, got out in 45 and served uh, the rest of his time in the reserves, uh, got out of the reserves right after the Korean War. Mm-hmm. So he was, was his own businessman. He, I was going to say, what did he do for a living? Yeah, he was, um, um, he was a full-time firefighter uh, for the city of Hickory, North Carolina, and he also owned his own business. He had a, a shell service station. It was called Tate Shell Service Station. And uh, I remember uh, he had uh, Tate Shell, and it was in great big letters, uh, illuminated letters on top of the service station. And the S uh, letter burned out, and it had <laughs> Tate Hell up there. And um, so uh, Dad would do a few commercials and uh, on the radio, and he said, business has been really good. We have sold the S out of hell. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And so uh, what about mom? She the the uh, what was she doing? Mom was uh, was a typical housewife. Mm-hmm. Um, brought me up uh, to stay at home. Um, I grew up in a neighborhood where nobody uh, locked their doors. We could go on vacation for two weeks, doors to stay open. Um, I remember one time uh, we had a fire in our home, it burned up all it was in the closet and burned up all of mother's clothes. And uh, they had no way of getting in touch with us because we didn't have cell service back then. But I remember all the ladies in the neighborhood came down and had the house completely cleaned up when we arrived home, except for the fact that mother's clothes were all burned up. But she got the insurance and got to buy a whole new wardrobe. (laughs) Well, that's not a bad deal. That's the kind of neighborhood I grew up in. Nice. And what what about you? What were you interested in? What were were you doing when you were a kid? Okay. um, uh, In our – and it's it's quite – ironic in our neighborhood we had a field that uh, was vacant and uh, we called it the battlefield and um, you have to understand this was in the early 50s and all of our parents had served in some uh, form of military service we had some marines we had navy we had army Um, didn't have any air force but we did have a navy pilot that was there so we would all put on the gear that our fathers brought home and would play army up on our battlefield and uh, and from uh, uh, we would dig foxholes and uh, we would make our own hand grenades but we couldn't pronounce hand grenades so we called them hanker nades <laughs> and a hanker nade was we <laughs> we would dig up uh, red clay in, in North Carolina, watch that, and uh, we'd put water on it and fashion it into balls and let it sit out in the sun, and then we would throw those, those at the enemy. And I remember one time uh, Eric Schufer got a black eye, and uh, his mother was not real happy that we were playing <laughs> battlefield and throwing hand grenades. <laughs> and then what about as you got older? As I got older, um, I really wanted to go to a military school. And... Um, My parents were not quite – I was an older kid, so my parents were not quite ready to let me go. Um, I got into uh, the scouts, got to wear the uniform. See, that was very important to me then, wearing the uniform, wearing it correctly. Um, In high school, um, I got into the band. I was a drummer. Uh, But the uniforms were all uh, shaped like the uh, – tailored after the West Point uniforms uh, with the high collars and the – and uh, and to me, that was just added to the uh, 
the desire to want to do something in uniform. Didn't want to be a firefighter. My father was, but didn't care to be a firefighter. My uncle uh, was a police officer. Didn't care about being a police officer. But there was something about the military that that um, was like a magnet to me. I would watch every, as a child, I would watch every movie, uh, a military movie on TV that would come on. Randolph Scott, you know, played those big He-Man, Marine, you know, um, kind of like you, you know, except you were in the Navy. <laughs> Uh, but th- those things, I gravitated toward that. My good friend, uh, Don Murphy, who I grew up with, uh, he did the same thing. He went to the Marine Corps. Um, and um, it was really, uh, he went the NCO route, I was the officer route. So at the times when we would be on leave and come home at the same time, uh, I had to go through this whole rigmarole about being an officer and, and enlisted men really knew what was going on and we were just there for showmanship. <laughs> when, uh, so what year did you graduate from high school? I graduated in 63. Uh, um, quite interestingly, um, I had uh, tried out for the United States of America High School Band uh, as a drummer and was offered uh, a trip. So we this is these are two to four students from every state in the union and um, we met at university of southern mississippi to practice and then we toured all down through the south across over into mexico uh, doing concert tours uh, all the way to hollywood we did a uh, we did a big concert in the hollywood bowl and uh, i mean how many people can say that you know and again in those outstanding uniforms that were similar to the ones that i wore band uniforms that i wore in high school um and so it just added to the to the uh and i was proud of that i, I was very proud to wear that uniform and i wore it right and i spit shine my shoes i did that all the way from junior high school when i was in the band all the way through high school so i knew how to spit shine uh, <laughs> Um, but then I was um, offered a full scholarship uh, to University of Southern Mississippi um, and also to University of West Virginia. Uh, I didn't like West Virginia because it's, everything was hills. It seemed like everywhere you went, you had to go up a hill. <laughs> and uh, I know you Navy guys, you, you like that stuff, but, but you know, I, um, I wasn't quite into that. So I, I took the scholarship to Southern Mississippi. Uh, their um, ROTC was mandatory for freshmen and sophomores. And so there again, here I was in uniform. Not only, and I was at the scholarship I was in at University of Southern Mississippi was a full full ride music scholarship, and I was a drummer in the University of Southern Mississippi band. Um, I, after my first year, I decided I didn't want to be a music major. Um, so I thought, well, you know, uh, I think I'll go into art design because I like to be creative in this. So um, uh, I transferred out of Southern Mississippi to my father's dismay because it was all paid for. <laughs> and, and I uh, enrolled in East Tennessee State University in Johnson City, Tennessee. Um, and there, um, uh, again, sophomore year, I, I was in my sophomore year, ROTC uh, mandatory. But the more I got into it, the, the more I just really gravitated towards that. And uh, I took my oath of office uh, uh, as a, an advanced corps cadet uh, as a junior. And uh, and from there on, it's just uh, I cared more about getting that commission than I did about getting my degree. Um, I had transferred majors um, from music to uh, art design. So, and that time we were all in the quarter system. So I had to go an extra quarter uh, uh, to take up all the courses that I needed to take. And I graduated in December of 67. First went down the aisle in cap and gown, and uh, then I... Uh, after I got my diploma, then all the cadets go out, take off the cap and gown, and we put on our uh, uniform uh, coats. We already had the pants and stuff on for that, so under the gowns. So I came down, and we were all commissioned in, and I remember my mom and dad uh, pinning those gold bars on my shoulder. Boy, I tell you what, I, uh, I felt like I had really accomplished uh, at least the first phase of my life. So that was 1967? Nin- December of 67. Um, I went on active duty in uh, March of 68 uh, as an infantry officer, brand new, what we call butter bar, uh, wearing the gold bar as a second lieutenant. Uh, I went to the infantry school. It's called the Infantry Officers Basic Course at Fort Benning. Uh, 
just on the other side of the hill from us were all the OCS guys. Um, they called OCS the Benning School for Boys. <laughs> um, and I'll never forget, uh, we were so, here we were, uh, commissioned officers, and there they were, hoping to be commissioned officers. And uh, many times we would march by their, their area, and I re- recall a big telephone pole, and on top of the telephone pole in the officer candidate school area was this black helmet, shiny black helmet with a gold bar in the center of the helmet. It was actually a helmet liner. Uh, and uh, the what they would try to OCS guys, they had this competition, who could get up there and get the helmet first. Of course, the pole was always greased. And uh, I don't know if anybody ever got up there and got that helmet without putting cleats on their shoes, but at any rate. Uh, uh, but, yeah, that's uh, – that was my first taste uh, at Benning of being a real Army officer. So this is 1967, so you must have pretty much known as an infantry officer you were going to end up going to Vietnam. Uh, yeah, uh, I, was, uh, I was ready. I was prepared. I was mil- uh, mentally prepared. Um, while at East Tennessee State, I was uh, a member of the Sigma Phi Epsilon fraternity. Uh, practically every one of the advanced corps cadets, juniors and seniors, were uh, advanced uh, army, uh, advanced corps army ROTC cadets, and everyone. This my fraternity was a big military fraternity, um, and we uh, we took great pride in that. Um, and uh, I, I remember we would inspect each other in the fraternity house before we would leave to go to drill on Thursdays, just to make sure everybody was dressed right, dressed ready front, and uh, and it was a it was an it was an honor. Uh, to be uh, an advanced corps cadet, and you had all of these underclassmen that this was our uh, that you were leading. This was our first time as really being a leader, giving commands, uh, uh, moving orders for uh, platoon and company drill, and 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 this kind of stuff. And so they were instilling in us. They being the cadre was instilling us uh, the correct way of of being an officer of showing authority without disrespecting people. Uh, and you can correct people without disrespecting people. And, uh, and I learned that um, through ROTC. Uh, and that's kind of, kind of interesting because uh, I know that ROTC cadets coming out and being commissioned uh, didn't have the greatest reputation amongst a lot of the NCOs in the Army at that time. So when it's 1967, and you mentioned that everyone, freshman and sophomore, had to be in ROTC. It was mandatory at uh, at University of Southern Mississippi, and it was mandatory at East Tennessee State University. I can't speak for the other uh, colleges and universities, but I would think that uh, perhaps that was the manner in which uh, every university, at least if it was a federally funded university, mm-hmm. uh, had to operate. Wow, that's pretty. So, what about what about like uh, as far as kind of the social aspects of America at the time? Were you starting to, in 1967? You were you really seeing much of the anti-war attitude or anything like no, that? No, not uh, we were not subjected to that. Uh, I don't recall that. Um, I recall that on campus. Uh, there was no snickering when in uniform. Every Thursday was drill day, and so everyone had to show up for drill day, had to be in proper uniform. Um, if you were a sophomore uh, or a freshman or sophomore, uh, you were carrying the M1 Grand Rifle, and every week uh, as a freshman or sophomore, you had to go to the arms room and clean your weapon, and it had to be uh, – and you see, you were taking ROTC for credit. So – for the two years as freshman and sophomore, you were taking ROTC for credit. So, yeah, you best uh, clean your weapon because if you didn't, you'd get a demerit. And uh, X number of demerits means you got a drop in grade. So we would actually go through and do inspection before uh, at, at on every drill meet, which is on Thursdays. And uh, that's how I learned how to inspect an M1 Garand rifle. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you ever fired one of those. But um, I think I actually have fired one. I think I actually have. I fired a bunch of different weapons. I'm you know, sure you we did. do like these familiarization shoots, and they right. pull out a bunch of old weapons and new weapons. And 
I can't, but I'm pretty sure I have fired one. Ah. But they used to have this, uh, when you would clean your rifle, when you'd pull the bolt back, uh, and you would have to clean down through the board and everything, and then what you would do is you would take uh, the little white uh, cloth that you used to stick on the on the bore rod to clean the clean the uh, clean the bore out, but you'd stick it down there and you'd look through, and the light from that would shine up through, and you could tell whether or not you had any uh, any materials in the bore that shouldn't be there. Mm-hmm. And uh, but then you had to you had to pull back on um, on the uh, the charging handle? Yes. And then let it go right quick so it would go forward. Well, if you didn't let it go right quick, you would get what's called M1 thumb because it would get stuck <laughs> right in. And many times I had M1 thumb uh, uh, on that. Yeah, but. <laughs> so uh, so you go to the infantry course, the, what would you call it, the basic infantry course? Uh, infantry officer's basic course, IOBC. So when, when you're in that, I mean, you must be, these guys are preparing you to go be a platoon leader in Vietnam. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah, 1542 platoon leader. And and this is now, is it 1968 now? 1968 now. So there's a lot of experienced guys that are teaching you. A lot, a lot. How long was that course of instruction? Nine weeks, if I think correctly. Was it nine weeks or 16 weeks? Uh, I think it was... Might have been 12 weeks. Mm-hmm. I'd have to think about that because I took my first command at Bragg. Uh, I was there in uh, in March, and I took my first command at Bragg in, uh, in, uh, around uh, August. So when you're going through that course, are you get forming up platoons and you're going out and doing training missions yeah, and that yeah, kind of thing? And yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, forming in platoons and companies, and then they rotated who was going to be platoon leader. I mean, we're all second lieutenants. Uh, well, not all of us. Uh, we had some direct commission guys in there. Uh, I had a I had a, a sergeant major who was direct commissioned to a captain. Oh wow! And uh, special forces guy, and uh, snake eater, <laughs> and uh, and uh, he um, he was uh, always the company commander. So, <laughs> uh, and great guy, wonderful guy. But we would switch roles around. Um, we uh, participated in all different kinds of maneuvers, um, whether it be. Uh, uh, an armored column with infantry in it, or whether it be uh, squad tactics, uh, whether it be platoon tactics, or whether it was in uh, uh, a company crossing over what, what then they called the um, uh, line of departure, the LD. Uh, we don't have that in warfare. Now everything, <laughs> there is no LD. It's a, like perimeter defense, and we're, we're going to that. But we practice all of that. Um, not everybody went airborne, but uh, we all did the uh, the uh, was a forty seven foot tower uh, mm-hmm. that dropped you out, and uh, so you get a feel for what falling with a shoot on is like. And uh, um, but well, I was on a night combat compass course, in, and there was uh, four of us. We went out in teams of four, pouring down rain at Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, Columbia, Georgia, Columbus, Georgia. And uh, it was in the early spring, and it was cold as hell. <laughs> and we were sitting there chattering, and it was a night combat compass course. We were dropped off at a point on a road in a deuce and a half. And all right, Team Alpha, out. So we would get out, and we knew where we were. It had a postmark with a number on it, and we had our map, so we knew where we were. And then um, we had our directions. Okay, you're 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 at point A. Uh, you got to be at point B, and you had to shoot your azimuth, looking at your map, see what shoot your azimuth with that, and then uh, go to point B, and then you go to point B to point C. But pouring down rain, cold, tea chattering. Only one guy in our force smoked, so we would have him light a cigarette and put it in his mouth, and he would go out following the azimuth until we would tell him to stop and light it so that we could make corrections. Okay, go two feet to your right, two feet to your left, so that he was directly on azimuth. And then he would stand there with his cigarette lit so and puffing on it so we could see the light, and then we would go to him. Then we'd shoot the next azimuth exactly the same way, send him out, and guess what? 
we made it. We made it. We were one of the first teams to make it through that night <laughs> combat compass course. Of course, along the way, uh, there were little surprises, like uh, an explosion would happen over maybe 20 meters to our right. So we'd have to go down. Well, it was all planned as to where this stuff was going to go. And we didn't realize it, but you know, there were seasoned troops out there taking care of us. They weren't going to let us get hurt. We didn't know that at the time. But, uh, but during that night compass course pouring down rain, I heard in the background, it got louder and louder and louder and louder and louder and finally, straight over our heads, two Huey aircraft. And I said to myself, those guys are dry. <laughs> <laughs> they have it better than I do. A couple of days later, in our company area, they had a sign up. Anyone interested in Army aviation, we're going to be given the flight aptitude test on a certain date. I was the first in the orderly room to sign up for that thing. <laughs> and then that was it. You got picked up for it? Graduated from uh, Benning. Took my first command at Fort Bragg. I was in uh, – interesting here I am, an infantry officer – and my command was a military and was with a military intelligence battalion, MI battalion. Here I am, an infantry officer. I'll never forget my first sergeant, my first first sergeant, Sergeant Chuck Hawley. I don't think that anybody ever forgets the name of their first first sergeant, not officers. And um, he brought me in. He treated me. I was kind of embarrassed because he had all these medals, and here I am, brand new second lieutenant, uh, no combat experience, and he treated me like. Uh, with great respect and uh he welcomed me aboard i, I mean i never forget the first time i walked in the orderly room he calls the orderly room to attention i was sort of baffled you know here i am second lieutenant <laughs> you looking over your shoulder for a colonel <laughs> yeah what in the world is going on <laughs> but uh yeah and i learned a lot from uh, sergeant holly uh my first first sergeant uh, never forget uh going out on a just a maneuver and uh here i am uh, we we have our a military intelligence it was military intelligence <clears throat> my bars military intelligence battalion air reconnaissance my actual unit and I was command of Alpha Detachment we had a live mission we would take photographs that were uh, taken by the Air Force sent back to Fort Bragg uh, for photographs over Vietnam sent back to Fort Bragg and my guys and Alpha Detachment and there was Bravo Detachment Charlie Detachment but. The missions given to our guys, we were actually uh, taking uh, the photographs and pulling intelligence out of the photographs using stereoscopes, which you can measure the height of various objects and so on and so forth. Then we would pull all that together, and we would get in a bird dog at uh, at Fort Bragg and fly that to D.C. and it and it was a real live mission. I mean, how many people can say that, you know, they were we were actually doing a real live mission in support of Vietnam at that time? Here I was, a little second lieutenant, you know, barely dry behind the ears, and uh, my first sergeant kept me straight. I had a bunch of warrant officers work for me too, and they really did all the work. Um, I was there just to sign my name and and uh, and thank my first sergeant for keeping me straight. How long did you do that job for? Four months. The orders came down, sending me to. Uh, flight school at Fort Walters, Texas. So you show up to flight school. Uh, when we were talking, to, when I was talking to Colonel Jackson, it, it sounded crazy, the number of helicopter pilots that were being trained at that time. It was amazing, totally amazing. You see, uh, Matt Jackson started off as warrant officer. So he had a whole different experience than I did. Um, that was for warrant officer candidate school. We called them walks. And people say, well, what's a walk? And we'd say, well, that's something you throw at a wabbit. <laughs> well, I think, I think it's funny because in, when, he, when he's talking about uh, you guys, the commissioned officers, yeah. they call them RLOs, real life officers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> so we had yeah. the real life officers yeah, and the yeah. walks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The real live officers. Yeah. And, um, and we were all, uh, each class had a designated color. Uh, 
and the uh, my class happened to be the yellow hat class. And you tell the different classes by the color of baseball cap that you wore. And uh, you had these funny wings uh, that you sewed on the, uh, on the front of your hat. Uh, they weren't aviator wings, but like student aviator wings. And uh, so uh, we had the yellow hats, the, the walk class going through. They were a yellow hat class, but we never, never got together. Hmm. Uh, and that was, um, that was the primary flight training. And that's where we just learned to fly. Uh, my first helicopter that I climbed into was a uh, – training helicopter 55 it's a Hughes 300 aircraft but it was small I mean you could probably get the whole aircraft uh, into this room would have to probably knock out part of your wall so the tail rotor would get it through but that's how small it was I mean it was smaller than the OH-13 and most people remember that by when they watched uh, MASH or the H-23 which was uh, back in that era as well but that's what I learned to fly on. It was so tiny, and being tiny, it wasn't easy to fly. It was very squirrely. So um, I remember people, I said, man, I wish I was in that 13 or that 23. And they said, well, you know, you're getting some great pilot skills in, in that TH-55 because you're learning how to adjust for wind and so on and so forth. And they said, boy, when you get to, when you get to Rooker, that Huey is going to be like you're climbing out of a little Fiat into a Rolls Royce. <laughs> and uh, I remember our first um, cross country, uh, after we'd soloed, uh, I soloed at my 14th hour. You had to solo within 16 hours or you got sent back to another class. So uh, I soloed uh, in my 14th hour. And uh, that's amazing getting, you know, the instructor pilot gets out and says, okay, you've got the aircraft. And uh, yeah, you fly the idiot circle, and uh, you call takeoff, you call uh, uh, turning uh, into the wind, you call base, and you call final. You had to do all the correct call signs and everything. And we were at little staging areas all around uh, Fort Walters, Texas, which was in Mineral Wells, Texas. So uh, we probably had staging areas as much as 50 miles out because you had all these classes and all these various staging areas. Um, and uh, I'll never forget, it was a little anxious when he climbed out of that cockpit, and I knew that I was in control. And uh, But then after you f flew your first solo, um, coming back in, the bus didn't stop at Fort Walters at the, uh, at the fort. It stopped at the Holiday Inn. Tradition is, everyone who soloed, the bus would stop there, and those who hadn't soloed yet stayed on the bus. Those who had already soloed got off the bus with the new solo guys, and they carried you and threw you in the pool <laughs> at the Holiday Inn. And interestingly, at the Holiday Inn in, uh, in, uh, at Mineral Wells, they had crossed Huey rotor blades that you walked under to go to the swimming pool. And uh, to have that honor of being thrown in the pool was just incredibly amazing and fulfilling did you have any did you have any trouble when you were going through aviation school did it come pretty naturally to you were you you know did, did it did you did you figure it out pretty quick or when you said 14 hours was that well, about 14, average well no i mean we had some guys that uh, that soloed at 10 hours i mean they were i mean just incredible but, but you have to understand a lot of the guys i went through with already had their private ticket mm. Uh, most most fixed wing. I don't know of anyone in my class that had a rotary wing private ticket. Uh, and had they done that, they could have probably so loaded in five hours. You know, it, it just all depends. But um, leaving there. Oh, here's the other interesting thing. All the pilots were getting this flight pay, plus we're getting our our normal uh, second lieutenant pay, which I think was like two hundred forty seven dollars a month. How much was flight pay? Oh, flight pay was God. I I know when I quit getting flight pay at the end, it was like four hundred something dollars a month. But so that's kind of crazy, right? Like you're almost doubling your pay. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And but but the interesting thing about it is you got all these single guys here. So what do we do? We go to the to the car dealer. <laughs> so everybody, I remember uh, uh, a good buddy of mine. It was my roommate. Uh, um, he and I actually lived in a motel right outside the gate of Fort Walters, and uh, he had a. Uh, Camaro uh, Z, what, Z28, whatever it was, <laughs> Z-Car, Z28, 
I had the Oldsmobile 442. Uh, and, I mean, that just goes on. All the hot cars, you know, the single pilots, you know, we thought our Sierra didn't stink. <laughs> we had that stuff, you know. We, you know, we were just uh, – there, there was something about that that just started the camaraderie just started building. And I remember when we left um, Fort Walters to go to Fort Rucker, Alabama for our, uh, our advanced training, uh, there were four of us that, that convoyed uh, all the way to uh, – and we, we made our first pit stop in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, but we convoyed all the way down through there. And we all had CBs in our cars. So, you know, it was like we were flying and we were talking to each other and, and that. And, and on the back of the car, we, um, everybody had uh, United States Army aviation uh, and a little sticker in the back of your window, you know. And, you know, like I say, we thought our Sierra didn't stink. <laughs> and uh, we, got to, uh, we got to Montgomery. We all checked in that night. And... Uh, I got a call from uh, the desk that said, uh, uh, I've got you listed as owning a, a, a 1968 Oldsmobile 442. It's a uh, black vinyl top with blue bottom. I said, yeah, yeah, that's, that's mine. He said, sir, you need to come to the desk. So I go to the desk, and there's a truck driver there. He had pulled his 18-wheeler into the parking lot of the motel where we're, the four of us were all staying didn't cut sharp enough and hit the oh. left rear <laughs> quarter panel of my car <clears throat> and tore it all to pieces. Um, I mean, it, Schneider Trucking, I'll never forget this. You see their trucks on the road all the time, and I'll forget to start. Oh, and he was so apologetic and, and so on, and called his dispatcher, and everything was fine. But um, anyhow, um, we had a couple of days before we had to report into uh, to uh, uh, Fort Rucker. So my plan was I was just going to drive the car up to North Carolina, give it to my dad, they'd get it fixed up. He'd give me his car, I'd drive it down to, to Rucker. Well, we get up the next morning, and I get a call from my roommate that had been my roommate uh, uh, in, uh, in the primary training. And he said, hey, Goomba, his name was John Vagnini. Hey, Goomba. Uh, okay, now the, the joke's up. I said, well, what are you talking about, John? Where's my car? I said, John, I don't have your car. Ah, oh, come on, come on. Somebody had stolen his car that night. <laughs> now, my car gets hit. Somebody steals John's car that night. Montgomery Police does all the, uh, all the investigation. And uh, so, the next, so after that was done, I said, okay, throw your gear in my car. We're driving to North Carolina. So we drove to North Carolina, uh, picked up my dad's car. Uh, in the meantime, John calls his dad, uh, who owned a company called Superior Plastics in, uh, in uh, Water, uh, I'll think of it in a minute, but in New Jersey. And uh, anyhow, John has a new car waiting for him, <laughs> just like that from that. But uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was the beginning of our uh, our. Advanced course in flying helicopters for the United States Army. So when you get to Ruck, uh, Fort Rucker, is that when you start flying the Huey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, and it was like everybody said, uh, the Huey came natural to me. Uh, it was just, I mean, it, it was amazing to uh, crank that thing up, and uh, and then to uh, uh, hold the cyclic and pull up on that collective, and that. I mean, it was just, it's like everybody said. It's like going from a Fiat into a Rolls Royce, and it was so easy. I mean, it was you know, even though it had a little crosswind, it wasn't it wasn't shifting like the TH fifty five did. I mean, the TH fifty five would shift if you had a three knot crosswind. So, uh, but it was an incredible, incredible aircraft. And um, of course, while we were flying that, we were also getting our uh, instrument training down there. That's the first time we'd been on instruments. So the instrument training was not in the Huey. It was in uh, an OH-13. Um, and that's where we were under the hood and, and uh, flying on instruments and, uh, and got what we called a TAC ticket, tactical ticket. It wasn't the regular standard instrument ticket that uh, one would normally get. Uh, but it was a tack ticket. 
And what was interesting about that, and this will come up later in our conversation, is I learned how to shoot ground control approaches very well, GCA approaches very well. And we'll talk about that later on in our conversation. Is that where you learned originally to shoot it? That's where I learned to shoot it. Yep. And it came in very handy in Vietnam. <laughs> so how, how much longer was it until you, uh, how long was that training? Um, that training we got there, and uh, so that had to have been about, uh, had, must have been about three, three or so months, because I think in July, yeah, it was in July that, um, that I got my silver wings pinned on me. And uh, my mom and dad drove down. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, experience. Uh, my girlfriend at the time came down with my parents. Uh, and I was so proud of those wings. I mean, I, I was so proud of being a butter bar in December of 67 and so proud of, of getting those wings. Um, uh, later on, uh, that would have been in 69. Uh, because, um, you know, 68, I took over the command and went to flight school, went through Christmas, graduated in, in July of 69. Uh, very proud of that. I remember um, every weekend while we were at Fort Rucker, uh, a bunch of us uh, would go to Panama City, Florida, and there was a young couple and their two children owned a motel there. So we went down, negotiated with them that uh, we would like to come down every weekend and stay in the same suite of rooms. And uh, and they knew that we were – everybody in flight school was on orders to go to Vietnam right out of flight school. And, and they were certainly aware of that. And so they took us up uh, on our offer that we would arrive on Friday night and leave on Sunday. And uh, uh, she had a, a, a closet a, in the suite, and she said, you just keep all your beach clothes and everything down here. Uh, I'll wash them, I'll clean them up for you, and I'll hang them back up in the suite. And she did that. Every night, every Friday night we got down there, she and her family had dinner prepared for the four of us, and we all ate together as a family. Now that's that's people who cared. Absolutely. And uh, I took my parents there, uh, and uh, right after we drove down to Panama City after I got the silver wings, and we stayed in that hotel that night and uh, uh, with them, and and uh, we all congregated the family that owned it. We all congregated together, and uh, then I left out the, the next day. My parents stayed down on Florida for a while. Uh, but the next day was the landing on the moon. Hmm. And we watched it after, my girlfriend and I watched it after we got back uh, into Hickory uh, from driving from Panama City, Florida. Now one of the things that I, when I first covered um, uh, Colonel Jackson's first book, you know, one of, the, one of the statistics that he brings up in the book is there was 5,000 Hueys sent to Vietnam and 3,200 of them were lost in combat. You, did your parents know these kind of statistics? Were they nervous as hell? Were they talking to you about you know what was going to happen? How did you feel about it? Um, my parents, uh, I never expressed any worry whatsoever about being. In fact, I wanted to go to Nam. Right after flight school, uh, there were too many infantry officers serving infantry aviators in Vietnam. There were not enough slots for all the infantry aviators. There were infantry aviators who were like, I'm third in line to, to uh, be a platoon leader uh, as a captain. Uh, so what happened uh, was all the infantry officers in my flight class out of Rucker, their orders were changed from Vietnam to stateside assignments. So I went to Fort Bragg and flew with Alpha Company 82nd Aviation Battalion. There, I flew with seasoned aviators who had come back from Vietnam. Uh, I was a platoon XO. My platoon leader was Captain Fred Dickens, who had flown with the Little Bears in the 25th Infantry Division. Uh, he had flown over into Cambodia during that incursion. A lot of that's written, Cambodia is written up in Matt's first book there. Um, but I learned a lot from Fred. I learned a lot uh, from the other, uh, uh, a lot of the war officers that were there. Uh, who just, uh, uh, Jim Foster, for example, um, he had flown with the 48th Blue Stars uh, and uh, learned a lot about him because we did a lot of tactical maneuvers with the 82nd uh, during that time. And uh, he sort of gave me a feel for what I would be doing when I got to Nam. Uh, 
Jim ended up being a roommate with uh, myself and uh, Fred Dickens, Captain Dickens. Um, Jim and I stayed friends t- until this day. He was going to get out of the Army, and I talked him into staying in the Army and, and encouraged him to, uh, to extend his enlistment as a war officer, which he did, and finally retired uh, out of the Army. I hope sometime Jim can hear this podcast and, uh, and can smile a little bit about that. What's very interesting is, is that <clears throat> after I, I put in my orders to go to Nam again, requested Nam. Orders came down, sending me to the 7th Infantry Division in Korea. <laughs> Commanding the 7th Infantry Division was a guy by the name of Hal Moore, mm-hmm. who was Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore in the Idrang Valley with the 1st Cav. And we all know about we were soldiers once and young. General Moore at that time was a two-star general, and um, I was the 7th Aviation Battalion Maintenance Officer. And when and General Moore was a rated aviator, he had to fly four month or four hours every month to maintain proficiency and draw flight pay. I don't know if you tell a general officer you can't draw <laughs> flight pay, but at any rate, uh, my job was to fly co-pilot with him, and I got to know him. And uh, so this is is this in Korea? This is in Korea now. See, I've put in orders. I put in a request to go to Vietnam. Twice. Orders come down, sending me to Korea. Okay. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> I was not that much aware of General Moore. I didn't know about the Idrang Valley back then. I mean, this was in 71. Uh, I didn't know much about the Idrang Valley. Not 71, I'm sorry. This was in uh, 70 uh, when I got to Korea from Bragg. And uh, so he asked me one day while we were flying how I liked my assignment with the 7th. And I told him, well, it was fine. But I said, if I don't get to Vietnam, sir, I can kiss my career goodbye. (laughs) Because, I mean, you know, I want to be a career Army officer, and if I don't have Vietnam time and have performed well in Nam, I'll never be a career Army officer. And he talked a little bit. He said, would well, you have a particular unit you want to go to? And I said, yes, sir, I'd like to go to the 25th Infantry Division uh, and fly with the Aviation Battalion. He says, um, any particular company? I said, Alpha Company, sir. They're known as the Little Bears. He said, oh, I know the Little Bears. I've heard of the Little Bears. They're a great unit. Um Oh, that was on Saturday. On Monday, I got a call from the general's aide, and it said, um, General wants to make sure you, you're ready to go to NAM. I said, Yes, I am. Okay, you want to go to Alpha Company, 25th Aviation Battalion? Oh, the general wanted to know if uh, you want to take any leave in the States. I mean, he can only authorize 20 days, but uh, I said, Well, sure, if I can get that. <laughs> Within three or four days, orders came down. Now, I've been in Korea now maybe four or five months by that time. Orders came down, and on usually orders, uh, and it, probably the same thing in the Navy, you have, uh, you have regulations that authorize such and such. There were no regulations authorizing anything on my orders. It was all VOCO, which means voice command, V-O-C-O, between Commander 7th Infantry Division, Commander 25th Infantry Division. Uh, VOCO, and it went all the way down to even commander of airlift in, out of Oakland. And um, my leave, my 20 days leave started. And so anyhow, I go to Kempo Airport. I get on the airplane. Okay, I'll fly home. My 20 days didn't start until I reached my home of record. And the 20 days was up the day that I left my home of record. So I'm on not on leave until I reach my point. Uh Left there after 20 days, flew to uh, Oakland, uh, then Oakland to Nam. I get to Nam, and this was in the fall of 70. I get to Nam, we're all getting off the airplane. You know, everybody hears about the humidity, how it just kills, sucks the air out of you when you get off the airplane, uh, at landing at Tonsonuk. So get off the airplane. Okay, uh, there's a. Uh, I think a lieutenant, either a major lieutenant colonel out there and a bunch of enlisted men. And uh, they say, okay, all the officers over to my right. Okay, and then the sergeant major says, okay, all the NCOs here in front of me. And there's another E-7 that says, okay, all the enlisted men down here on this side. So we all get over there, okay. Now they're calling out names. So the colonel, the colonel major is calling out all the officers' names. Says, is there any name that I haven't, everybody's raising their hands, any name I haven't called out? I said, here I am. He said, uh, you must be Captain Tate. I said, well, yes, sir, I am. He said, well, your charper will be here in 20 minutes. Jeez. 
and a chopper flew in from the 25th, from Alpha Company 25th Aviation Battalion to pick me up. <laughs> Holy mackerel. So pick me up, take me to Coochie, where the 25th headquarters is. We get out of Jeep. You must have made a hell of a imp- good impression on a, General a, Moore. Oh, my a goodness. Jeep, a Jeep picks me up, drives me to the orderly room, and I, you know, I go in and salute to the company command. I mean, who's a major, major's command at companies um, um, in Nam. And um, the major said, I don't know who the hell you are, but <laughs> welcome aboard. <laughs> <coughs> Shook, my, <coughs> Shook my hand. And uh, that was my introduction to the Alpha Company 25th Aviation. Whew. That's amazing. <laughs> That's, you know, you, you made a, a joke about, hey, I don't know if you can, if you need to uh, take the, the flight pay away from a general officer. Apparently, those general officers had some power. That's incredible. General Hal Moore, um, and I've read the book. I've watched the movie quite a few times. Uh, uh, even uh, General Moore, before he passed away, thought that uh, Mel Gibson did a good job uh, representing him and, and the sergeant major. Um, but, uh, you know, that was a, he was a hell of a man, a great leader. Uh, he, was, uh, he was not one of these uh, – General officers that set himself up on a plateau. He was down with his troops, and uh, and and I saw that quality in him, and uh, I was in great admiration mm-hmm. for that. So you show up. So you show up. Uh, what's the first thing that happens when you show up in Vietnam? <laughs> now, they, they, what did they? They must have thought you were the best pilot or something. <laughs> they must have thought you were somebody. <laughs> the uh, company XO. Company commander says, "Exo, get Captain Taylor a place to stay." The Echo, uh, the Exo said, uh, "Well, sir, where would you like to stay?" And uh, I said, "Well, my buddy Fred Dickens, Captain Dickens, he he stayed in a hooch called the Holiday Inn." He said, "Is that still around?" He said, "Oh, yes, sir. The Holiday Inn's right over here." He said, "Let me say, oh yeah, there's a bunk available." So I stayed in the same hooch that Captain Dickens <laughs> stayed in, and uh, after I got everything squared away. Uh, uh, the exo said, uh, now there are going to be cocktails up here at uh, Captain so-and-so's place. And he showed me where there was, and he said, uh, he said, uh, so come on up and meet the guys. Well, this captain was great at fixing martinis. So, heck yeah, I went up there, had a martini. They had some hors d'oeuvres out there, and I thought, wow, this is <laughs> Vietnam. I said, this is, re- this is really crazy. So uh, I was with them. Right at two months into the 1st of November, and um, orders came down for the 25th to draw down uh, and prepare to head back to Hawaii. And I thought to myself, man, this is really great. I've been here two months now. I'm going to Hawaii. And uh, I'd already been laying out on top of a bunker in a lounge chair. I had a, a nice suntan, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, of course, my dermatologist doesn't think it's a nice suntan today. But at any rate, uh, I thought, wow, this is going to be real. I said, I'll get to Hawaii. I'll, you know, I'll already have my tan. Everything look good. Well, uh, no. Uh, everyone who had uh, less than six months in country got reassigned. So uh, I found my young rear – on a C-130, several about a week or so later, headed to I Corps. There was no everything was pacified in Three Corps where, where the 25th was. Uh, I never flew into one hot LZ. In fact, I never flew into an LZ in Three Corps. That had all been pacified. So, I mean, I had I never even heard the door gunners work out uh, with the 25th because there was there was no enemy threat. We thought, at least at that mm-hmm. time, mm-hmm. it wasn't apparent. Get on the C-130, uh, fly me up to uh, Fubai, Fubai International, uh, I Corps, uh, very close to the uh, to the North South Vietnamese border. Uh, get off the aircraft, uh, got my parachute packing bag with me, uh, full of my stuff, pouring down rain, and. Uh, they all load us into a building and t- say we were going to go to Screaming Eagles uh, uh, orientation training. And uh, we did that for uh, about a week. And then I got reassigned uh, to my regular unit. 
Now, interesting, I was with Alpha Company uh, 82nd uh, Aviation Battalion. When I got to the 7th, I was actually assigned uh, as a staff maintenance officer, but I was located in Alpha Company 7th Aviation Battalion. 25th, I go to Alpha Company 25th. Where did I get assigned with 101st Aviation Battalion? Alpha Company, 101st Aviation Battalion, known as the Comanchero Flight. That was the week after I had uh, become a 101st Air Assault Trooper. Then how long was it before you started flying missions with them? Took my check ride the next day. Uh, I was a Peter pilot the following day. Went into a hot LZ. First time I'd ever heard the M60 machine gun door gunner and crew chief working out. The ship literally danced when they pulled that trigger. Uh, you could feel the shake going in. And going out hot LZ, I heard ding, ding, ding. Three pings on the aircraft. Came back, and I, I experienced what they call, you got your cherry busted. <laughs> we took three rounds in the aircraft going at LZ. Uh, came back that night. Once you got your cherry busted in the unit, a lot of esprit de corps. I mean, the esprit de corps like you would, well, you would because you've experienced that, Jocko. But, but, but I hadn't experienced anything like that. And uh, so what do we do? You had to get initiated before you could wear the unit patch. And we had to drink this drink called a flaming Hooker. <laughs> Sounds tasty. <laughs> uh, it was uh, Southern Comfort. Uh, and you take a match and you light it. So you got the blue flames coming up. <laughs> and uh, Echo's laughing here like he knows. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> and you had to drink it down. All the way down, set the glass down while the blue flame is still burning inside of it, then turn it upside down, and if more than two flaming drops came out of that glass, you had to drink another one <laughs> until you got it down. <laughs> now, keep in mind, I was an RLO, a real live officer. <laughs> All of the warrant officers, they had a spree of corps like you. You've heard of the War Officer Protective Association, the WAPA. <laughs> they took care of each other. Well, they all, most of them had mustaches. Well, can you imagine drinking that flaming hooker and you've got a mustache and that blue flame is coming up? And uh, there, there were quite a few times that the, the mustaches had to be put out. And, of course, the bartender was there with a glass of water that he could throw. <laughs> Over on, in our little officers club, I but. was I was on a little assignment overseas, and and <laughs> we were in a bar, and they had a they had like a executive happy hour from you know four till six, so we'd show up there at three fifty nine, and it was free drink, it was free drinks, free drinks. <laughs> free drinks for two hours, and I had like half a platoon with me, oh. so we're in there, and this is when I was a young enlisted guy, I was crazy, and so we drink for the two hours. And then we get done, and now obviously everyone's primed. But I remember telling the bartender, uh, "We actually, yeah, we 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 had run up quite the tab." And I looked at the bartender. And I said, "We don't want to drink anything else unless it's on fire." <laughs> so every drink he was poured is lighting everything on fire. It was total total mayhem. <laughs> uh, you know, we all got a we all couldn't wait till a new guy came in to the outfit, and and, and that was in the O Club. Hey, the enlisted guys. God they, knows what was going they on were over sadistic. there. <laughs> <laughs> they were sadistic. But, but we couldn't wait till a new guy came in. You know, one of the things that Colonel Jackson talked about and wrote about was, uh, you know, some of the flying that you're doing when you're, when you're uh, formation fly, flying and how it's so much closer than it was back in the States and then the, the whole thing with the hover holes and getting down in there and having to listen to your crews like a hundred percent. You can't see actually what they're telling you. You just have to trust them. Did you were you up to speed on that stuff or did you have to just get the steep learning curve? Learn formation flying at Fort Rucker. Fort Fort Rucker. When I left Fort Rucker, I was confident I could fly that airplane. I knew I could fly that thing. And um, and we uh, uh, Right where the Jesus nut is on a on a Huey, with, which which holds the main rotor in, uh, there's like a, a red rubber gasket. So what you would do is you would for the helicopter. Let's say we're flying uh, echelon left. 
uh, all helicopters from the lead are going to the left. To fly formation in that, you would come up and you would have you would put the red rubber uh, uh, grommet right on uh, right about just below the windshield, just at the lower end of the. So that would keep your height mm-hmm. above it, so you wouldn't get caught up in a rotor wash from the other helicopter. But you would keep it up, and in a in a uh, staggered or uh, echelon left. Uh, you've got the lead, but every other helicopter is a little bit higher mm-hmm. than the ones in in, uh, in front of them. Um, and we flew a lot of formation flying uh, at Rucker, so I felt very comfortable with that. Um, and and then, I, like I say, I was very fortunate to go to the 82nd uh, after uh, infantry sc- uh, after flight school uh, instead of going straight to nine because I I became even more proficient that and more proficient in in uh, in formation flying. Uh, but there's one thing you learn in formation flying in NOM is you don't want to get too damn close because one round could take out two, mm-hmm. especially if it's 23 Mike Mike or 37. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, you don't want to be flying through debris. Uh, I mean, you, you know, so you did. Um, and, and, and we'll get talking about Lamson 719. Uh, we did 20 second separations in, in that. How long were you? How long were you then with 101st before Lamson went down? Okay, um, so I got to I got to 101st. Uh, uh, got into my unit a week before Thanksgiving of '70. Um, quick side story: uh, my cousin Charlie Finger was with the uh, 501st Signal Battalion, listed guy, on his second tour, volunteered for his second tour. Um, I got a hold of Charlie, brought him over to uh, our unit, took him to the officers' club. We had Thanksgiving dinner together. Uh, now think about that: you're with your family having Thanksgiving dinner together, November 1970, and uh, uh, it was just a wonderful day to see Charlie. Uh, I never saw Charlie after that. Uh, he de-roast, uh, went home. Uh, I said, I, I told him, I said. Um, Charlie, I'll come over uh, one night, grab you, and uh, you can be my guest at uh, at uh, the art, the artillery uh, uh, battalion there because they always had the good shows, the USO shows and the Korean shows with all the all girl Korean bands. I said I'll come over and get you one night. He's and he said, "Sir," uh, I said, "Charlie, I, I'm your cousin." He said, "Sir, it wouldn't be safe for you as an officer to be around our barracks at night." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, fragging was a thing oh, over there, and uh, it was. Uh, so I took him to that, and uh, all right. So make a long story short, um, I, I'm flying combat missions. I flew my first command and control SOG missions, uh, probably by in December, because uh, they just didn't let anybody fly uh, at the command and control uh, uh, North missions. Um, you had a chance to have three R and R's, or you could have two R and R's. If one of your R and R's, you wanted to go back to the states, so I elected to go back to the states a week after a week after uh, Christmas, and uh, went back, spent a wonderful time with my family, uh, New Year's Eve there uh, with Fred Dickens. Uh, he and uh, by the time his wife, uh, my old CEO, Captain Fred, and uh, I left about a week after. Uh, after that, to fly back to uh, Vietnam, got into uh, Tan Sanut and uh, tried to get a went to flight operation. I said I need to get up to uh, Fuba, and the guy said, "Sir, there's there's a major major operation, big thing going on." He said, "I don't I don't know when I can get you out of here." I said, "I got to get out of here quick if there's a major thing going on." I said, "He said, well, sir, just stick around here." And lo and behold, within an hour, uh, they had a, a C C one twenty three, flying up. That's one thirty and one. There's a big difference between those two aircraft. But you'd rather fly on a one thirty. Anyhow, C one twenty three is only two engines. So we, that, we, we, when you were flying those, um, when you flew SOG missions, I mean, I look at the profile of those SOG missions that those guys were doing, and it just it's it seems just completely crazy. Were Were you thinking that? Were you thinking, okay, here's whatever. Two Americans and four Vietnamese soldiers. I'm going to drop them off in the middle of Cambodia or Laos, and and we'll see what happens. Did that seem crazy to you? 
You know, it didn't. <laughs> it, it didn't. And, and, <laughs> right on. And, I, and I'll tell you what, man, we would fly down to uh, Da Nang. Uh, we flew out of three lo- with SOG. Da Nang was the major base. That was our headquarters. There was one at Phu Bai, and there was one at Quan Tri Dong Ha area. Uh, the ones we flew out of uh, Da Nang were crazy. I mean, it was, I mean, it's like they got the music going and everything. And, everything. and, uh, and we'd flight follow with Covey, the Air Force mm-hmm. uh, fixed wing, who would be up above us and, and uh, vector us into where we were supposed to go. Uh, I don't know how much of this I can. I guess it's pretty declassified by now. Yeah, well, I mean, it's pretty declassified. It's been 20 years was the, okay. was the time limit. So uh, here's a. Here's a mission. We go into a, we fly a team in. Uh, you know, we put them in an area where Covey has uh, uh, either told us or shot white white phosphorus down and landed, and then we we, we spiral and go down into the landing zone, uh, spiral and go into the landing zone. We drop them off. Uh, then uh, if they get into contact, uh, then we got to go back in there and, and pull them out. Which that did happen. Uh, quite a few times. A, a lot of times it didn't happen. It didn't happen at all. Uh, there were times we went in uh, and they were in contact and we had to pull them out with ropes, McGuire rigs, 120 foot ropes stretched 10 feet, 130 foot. They had to strap them on. We had to pull them out of the, out of the jungle. Sometimes it was ladders that we would drop down and they'd climb up on the ladders and get out. Um, what, and that was extractions. Um, we never did... Well, yeah, we did some insertions with ropes, too, uh, because they were going out on the side of a mountain and there was no way with foliage, uh, and there was no way we could land. Um, so we would, we would put them down. But I remember times that I pulled the guys out on ladders, and there would be – there were three guys on my ladders. Now, you got to think about that and the density altitude and what that does to the lift of helicopter. So we got them out and got them back in to Vietnam. That's when you say, "Oh my God! Thank God we're back in Vietnam." You know, that's when you that's when you start to realize it. And we came in and we had to land in a like a rice paddy so these guys could get off the ladders and get back in our our choppers. And you just didn't. And any any moment, you just felt like this is it. I'm gonna I'm gonna buy it. And a couple of our guys did, and uh, on command and control North missions and uh, died. And uh, a lot of the uh, saw guys went with them. So, uh, that's, you know, that's the bad part. I lost 14 guys uh, the year I was uh, in Nam. Um, but here's one mission. We, f- we flew in. We, we, we were going to insert a team. Landed in the LZ, big elephant grass, probably eight feet high. Rotor wash lays the grass down. And when it did, the whole LZ was ringed with MVA. <laughs> And our door gunner started working out and firing. Everybody's firing, and, and everybody said, "Sir, get the hell out of here! Get the hell out of here!" And we were firing, firing. We, we were taking rounds too, but nobody, nobody aboard our aircraft was injured. I mean, that's just one thing. We would do prisoner raids. Intel would tell us where there was a, a big NVA battalion headquarters. We had we had all the all the intel on it. We knew the comings and goings. Had been watched and watched and watched. And uh, we would fly out, fly to four. The, uh, the third aircraft was always – had the medic on it, and the fourth aircraft was the aircraft that would pull your ass out if you got shot down. First two aircraft would go in. Uh, I happened to be on the second aircraft on one of these personal raids where we went in and landed right in the damn middle of a bat- NVA battalion headquarters. The guys on board jump out. I bet you we weren't on the ground – 20 seconds and they're coming back in they've got captives they've got uh, all sorts of documents in their hand we get back on that ship and we're our asses out of there going to the nine i mean that's the and and it it was exciting i mean i'm not going to tell you it, the anxiety wasn't there but it sounds i wasn't scared to say the least. <laughs> it was exciting and they would come back and have cold beers yeah I mean, that's SOG. Yeah, another day at SOG. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess you did think those missions were a little bit crazy. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> but it was fun crazy. You know, we were young. We didn't know any better. I guess to fly them today, 
<laughs> I probably couldn't see the damn instruments, but. <laughs> Uh, so you're flying, you fl- flying a bunch of those missions, and and now you're. I mean, it sounds like you're racking up some pretty good hours and some pretty good um, experience yeah. at doing it. And and then so so Lam Son, when did you? So you got back from your your Christmas and New Year's leave. So that's January, whatever. Yes, yeah, it's, it's so early you, part of January. You come back, and now it's um, it's you get told immediately, hey, there's some kind of big operation. We don't really know what it is, but you got to get up there. Um. No, they just said there's a big operation going on in I Corps, and and they and I said I got to get up there. Uh, I told them I'm a platoon commander up there. I've got to get up there. Yeah, my guys uh, need me up there. So, so anyhow, I get up there. Um, it's very well. The it's kept quietly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when I got into my unit and said, "What the hell's going on?" People kind of looked at me like. What? What are you talking about? And I told them all about that. And uh, my company commander knew about it, Major Cluel, Bob Cluel. He's in the book. Yeah. Uh, Bob knew about it. Um, but at any rate, that's when I told you that prior, and this was in January, uh, we take a, a, a SOC mission out of uh, CCM mission out of uh, Dong Ha. And uh, we're flying towards the Laotian border, uh, crossing in the vicinity of Quezon when – those red balls of orange balls of fire start coming up at us and we have to take evasive action or or get shot down uh by 23 mike mike or 37 I don't. So, and we knew and and see as far as as far as i'm concerned that was reconnaissance in prep four mm-hmm. and that wasn't just one reconnaissance that was just one of many reconnaissance in prep four lamson 719 so the the premise of Lamson Seven One Nine, and again the the book Undaunted Valor, it's, it's Volume Three. Lamson, the subtitles Lamson Seven One Nine. The the premise of the operation is that America wanted to go into Laos and shut down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. They also America didn't want to put any troops, any American troops, on the ground inside of Laos because they didn't like the way that looked politically. So they decided, well, we'll run the operation using South Vietnamese soldiers. But in order to actually execute the operation, they were going to need to have American aviation because America was the only one really capable of doing that job of airlifting all these South Vietnamese soldiers into Laos. And then on top of that, if you're going to use the helicopters, then we're going to use the air support too and the air assets. So that, that's sort of the, the premise of the operation and it's a big operation. The goal, like I said, the goal is to kind of put a put a halt on on the, the portion of the Ho Chi Minh Trail that ran through Laos. And 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 the and and and, and the headwaters of that was in the town of Sapon. So that was the final objective mm-hmm. was to capture Sapon. It's spelled T C E P O N E. Right. It's got a weird spelling. Yeah, it's got a weird spelling. <laughs> uh, but yeah. yeah. That that was the goal. And that was kind of the that Sapong was the furthest away, the fur, the deepest into Laos. The, Correct. To get to there would be Correct. The furthest north of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Call it the headwaters of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. I would say there's also and and reading about it, there was also the underlying uh goal was to sort of to prove that the South Vietnamese military could conduct these operations, that they were capable that they were capable of doing these kind of things. That was part of Nixon's uh, Vietnamization uh, policy. The more that the South Vietnamese could prove that they could uh, take care of themselves and defend their homeland, then the less there was need of U.S. forces, especially ground forces. Mm-hmm. So you're saying that your, uh, your company commander kind of knew about it when you showed up there? I have to think he did because – uh, Major Cluel did not seem overly surprised. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, if I recall, and I hope I'm not making this up, but if I recall, he seemed surprised that I made it up in as quick a time as I did from from Saigon. Now, prior to the actual execution of Lamson Seven One Nine, there was another operation that was to push up to uh, to the Quezon. Combat base. Yeah, off of Route Nine. It's called Dewey Canyon Two. 
that now did you participate in Dewey Canyon too? You know, I have to think I did, but I'm not. <laughs> it's kind of hard to because uh, uh, I flew so much. I mean, I, I flew over 1,200 hours in Nam, 950 of which were actual combat missions. Uh, so I, I have to think that I d- did. Uh, I never recall uh, flying any what they call convoy support. Uh, a lot of that would have been done by Charlie Model and, and Cobra gunships um, to take action. Um, I, I, no doubt in my mind that I fly supporting operations for Dewey Canyon mm-hmm. too. Um, but uh, I, I never quite tagged it as as Dewey Canyon too. Mm-hmm. Uh, hell, I had so much going on anyhow of trying to keep my one officers and enlisted men and 10 helicopters flying. But the point of Operation Dewey Canyon too was to was to push up into Quezon, which and get control of it, and then that was gonna then be used as a logistics hub and an air hub to conduct this big operation um, Lamson 719, that, that's what the purpose was. But in addition to that too, was to uh, put the uh, uh, South Vietnamese Army in a position to where they could readily launch uh, across the border. So pre-staging all these folks, all these soldiers Roger up there that. Roger and that. get them ready. Uh, the, the, the area that you were going into had some serious um, enemy troops in there you know the you know some of the estimates I read 7,000 combat troops on the ground in that area of Laos 10,000 support personnel um, another another 5,000 path at Lao fighters so it was not, this was you were going into tough country 33,000 total is the estimate that's pretty much uh, kicked around um, of all of all the categories you, you just described so when did you when did you actually find out that this mission was going down? Uh, we got the briefing on it. The mission actually um, started on eight February of seventy one. By that time, Hunter uh, First uh, Command Post um, was in operation at Quezon. Um General Barry was up there. Uh, Matt Jackson features a lot of Barry in the book. Um, and I have some stories about that that I'll share with you later on. Um, I flew several missions in support of that, taking uh, troops into uh, Hill 30, Hill 31. Ranger, Arvin Rangers were in 31. Um, we flew, so we have pickup zones, uh, uh, PZs, if you will. Uh, at various stages, we'd land in and then take them to the to the LZ uh, around there. Uh, but that was just in prep for, uh, and really um, the big action for me, the the thing that uh, I guess uh, uh, made me realize that my God, there's a real war going on was in LZ Lolo, which was on the 3rd of March. Yeah, I'll tell you one thing that's interesting. When you, when you read this book and when you hear about this this operation, you know, most of the time when you think of, oh, the, what, the, what the Vietnamese are doing, it's sort of like what the North Vietnamese are doing, what the Viet Cong are doing. It's sort of like a hit and run. It doesn't seem like these big conventional operations. And if they did do a big assault on a base, you know, they'd kind of do it, they'd, They'd mess some things up and then they'd leave. They were doing big coordinated attacks against the South Vietnamese forces. It, this was almost like bordering. Uh, in fact, this was like conventional conventional war. warfare, correct? And uh, uh, but you didn't see that right on f- eight February. Mm-hmm. Uh, that came later on, um, and uh, it was devastating to to witness some of what I witnessed um, after the 3rd of March, what I witnessed on the ground with the South Vietnamese Army, um, especially when we would go into resupply um, around Hill 30 and Hill 31. 
I, I saw some heroism, but I saw so many uh, of the Arvin Army of uh, the South Vietnamese Army. I uh, saw so many of those soldiers throw the weapons on the ground and run to grab onto our skids so that when we lifted off, we'd pull them out of the battle space. Uh, that was disheartening. It was horrible. Yeah, I remember reading one one part where it's exactly what you said. A resupply comes in, and the the helicopters, as they leave, they're overloaded with Arvin soldiers that are just trying to get out of there. Throw their weapons on the ground and run and grab onto a skid. Uh, I mean, I witnessed uh, soldiers losing their grip and falling 1,500, 2,000 feet to the ground below. And and you think, do you feel sorry for them? Or do you say, hey, you coward, you got what's coming to you. And, uh, you know, it, it got to the point, Jocko, where um, we would, I remember landing in, and I can't remember, I think it was 31 that I landed in. Uh, but we were landing where mortars were blowing up right in front of us. And we would have to maneuver over, and, maneuver, and mortars were flying, were hitting everywhere in that LZ. And um, we would literally come to about a 10 foot hover, kick off the supplies. Can't come into lower because they would jump on your ship. And even at a 10 foot hover, they would run, jump on people's back, and they would hoof them up onto the skid. I mean, a 10 foot hover. Uh, and, uh, and you start to wonder, well, when's it going to be my day? You know? And uh, I remember having this. Uh, Having this uh, thing that came through my mind is, uh, uh, you know, I know I'm going to die. So I'm just not going to worry about dying. I know I'm going to die. Just don't let me get shot up so bad my mother can't recognize me. <laughs> but I knew I was, I was going to get it. Mm -hmm. I just, and then I, then it didn't bother me anymore. It did not bother me anymore uh, about dying, Mom. Um, I accepted the fact that it was going to happen, and you got to take care of me. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother would recognize me. Mm -hmm. God, ha having that feeling, though, and then seeing the South Vietnamese just, you're doing all you can to help them out, risking your lives, and they're just wanting to get out of there. We picked up body bags of the South Vietnamese, uh, <clears throat> body bags for U.S. forces, <clears throat> and you've seen them. They're sturdy, they're zippered. The body bags for the South Vietnamese forces were like one of our Martinizing bags, little thin plastic bags, had bodies in them. They had laid out in the sun for, for several days. They were all bloated and uh, uh, body fluids filling up inside the body bags. And, and uh, <clears throat> that's the only time where we really put skids on the ground so they could load up bodies. And, of course, the Vietnamese didn't run and jump on the aircraft because they didn't want to run and jump on all those bodies that were bloated and uh it got to the point where we had to uh where we had to wear gas mask. one of us in the cockpit had to have a gas mask on because of the smell it was just nauseating and uh we would bring them back into caisson or lz brown wherever where our pickup zone was and the south Vietnamese troops would unload the bodies and i remember i remember one it just it just the guy grabbed the arm of a body, and when he tried to pull the body out, the whole arm came out of the, out of the body. Uh, it was just sickening. Uh, it was beyond, um, it was beyond anything that most humans would ever experience. And uh, you know, you 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 go through that, and you say, well, <laughs> what's the purpose? Why are we, why are we here? Why are we doing this? I had a warrant officer who I asked uh, during Lamson to f ask. I said, I need more people to fly this mission. He said, I'm not going to fly the mission. I said, I need you. Well, I'm not going to fly it. I said, why not? He said, because nobody cares. Congress doesn't care whether I live or die. And what's the use? Look what they're doing up there. And I said, well, Mr. And I won't say his name, but you got to do what you got to do. He had too many hours, you know. He had over 140 hours flying that month, so he was he was way within his legal rights to say, "I'm not going to fly anymore." But guess what? Most of us had that as well. Most of us were flying. Uh, I mean, dead tired, mm -hmm. and we did it. And uh, but you know, uh, that started me thinking: Who cares? Who really cares? 
whether we do whether we do or not, uh, whether we die or whether we come home alive. I mean, look at what the South Vietnamese are doing. Vietnamization, yeah, tell me about it. Richard Nixon, why aren't you over here at Lamson 719 looking at this? And then you tell me Vietnamization. Um, it made me a changed person. And we hadn't even talked about LZ Lolo. Yeah, but I mean, LZ Lolo came a little bit into the operation. I mean, I just kind of want to run through a little yeah. bit of the timeline yeah. of. So this this operation starts on February eighth. The, there's four thousand Arvin that are going in on on Route Nine. The 39th Ranger Battalion is heloed into LZ Ranger. The 1st Infantry, Infantry Division is going into LZ Blue and Don and White and Brown. Yeah. And and FSB's Hotel Delta and Delta One. And again, the the book gives such good detail on all sides. The planning, what the how the decisions were being made. It's just it's just a fantastic uh, uh, recounting of what happened. Um, and meanwhile, it's still Vietnam. You still got bad weather. You still got low clouds. You got heavy anti-aircraft fire. The there's a lot of airstrikes are happening. So, uh, you know the the B-52s are dropping bombs. Um, Arc lights. Yeah. The but look, there's a lot of a lot of NVA up there, and they're they're ready to fight. Then they start actually um, attacking. Like I said, like the, like by by I don't know February sixteenth, seventeenth, the 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 NVA starts doing organized attacks. Correct. And um, really bringing it to to the to the people to the to the South Vietnamese soldiers that are now on the ground. Um. And here's here's another thing that I was reading about. Um, by February 24th, there there were reports coming back that the that the North Vietnamese had completed a new route, and they were just going around that area of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. They were just you know okay, well you guys want to block that? Cool. We'll just we had another alternate route. Um, February 25th, just a massive uh, uh, North Vietnamese assault. And it's combined arms. They got armor. They got yeah. artillery. Yep. They got infantry assault. They're doing combined arms assaults. Again, this is not what we typically think of in Vietnam. I know it happened from time to time, but it's not what you generally think of in Vietnam. You don't think of pitched conventional warfare like we're dealing with here. Um, there's just, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the one quote I got was, 94, there's a, a helicopter resupply to FSB-30, and 94 South Vietnamese soldiers forced their way onto the helicopters to get out of there, including the commander. That's on March 2nd, by the way. Uh, we get to March 3rd, which which you've um, discussed a few times, and and, well, actually, let me jump into this um, small small portion of the book here that that talks about some of what you guys were doing. I'm going to go to the book here. Warrant Officer Doug Womack, Rattler 28, and Chalk 3 considered aborting his approach, watching Arnie being shot down and hearing flight lead calling for mission abort. Not hearing anything else about aborting the mission, he decided he needed to insert his load of Arvin soldiers. Unbeknownst to him was the fact that no Arvin had survived in the first two aircraft. Hmm. Approaching the landing zone, he was subjected to the same intense fire as the chalks before him. Upon landing, an RPG rocket was fired but slammed into a stump and exploded, showering the aircraft with shrapnel. When it did, time stood still for Mr. Womack as it seemed he could count the main rotor passing in front of the aircraft. Several rounds ripped across the aircraft from three bursts of AK-47 fire. The rotor blades, cabin, lower fuselage, and skids all received the damage. As the aircraft lifted out of the landing zone, hammer blows were felt by the pilot, and the pilot looked back. 
Not only were there holes in the floor of the cargo area, but strange sounds told him that the main rotor might have taken some hits as well. Chalk 4 followed Chalk 3 into the landing zone where it received intense small arms fire, crashed, and burned. Mm. Chalk 4 crew scrambled back to Chalk 5 and rode out. This kept up as each Chalk came into the landing zone to drop off the Arvin soldiers on board. Chalk 16, Comanch- Camanchero 30, flown by Bob Morris, entered the cauldron of fire and landed. Like everyone before him, he could feel and hear the hits on his aircraft. We're on fire, someone said over the radio, but didn't identify themselves. Morris pulled in power and initiated his takeoff. Very calmly, he heard his crew chief say over the intercom, "Uh, Mr. Morris, you do know we're on fire, don't you? Mr. Morris quickly returned to the landing zone and exited the aircraft. Chalk 18 approached the landing zone at 90 knots airspeed instead of the usual 40 knots when so close. He picked out his landing point just as a mortar round exploded at that spot. Suddenly, his tail dropped low and the nose went high as Captain Tate went into a hard deceleration with numerous hammer taps on the aircraft. Three feet from his touchdown point, there was a loud explosion. Explosion. A gaping hole appeared in the window frame and there was the smell of hot metal. Engine oil pressure was no longer steady but fluctuating. Arvin soldiers had no desire to wait for him to land and dove out of the aircraft to safety of a prone position on the ground. Pulling in an, pulling in an armpit of collective, Tate's aircraft, tail number 049, raced out of the landing zone with a hail of small arms bullets ch- chasing after him. His aircraft had flown its last mission. Within an hour, only 19 of the 40 aircraft were able to enter the landing zone. Nineteen out of forty aircraft were able to enter the landing zone. Morris crashed in the landing zone, came back in, crashed. We had another aircraft went in Berg, flown by Berg. He crashed in the LC. They were on the ground. One of the co-pilots, Captain uh, Jerry Cruz, uh, Comanchero, been a second tour in Vietnam, first ter- tour as a Ranger. Uh, Jerry was on the ground with a Prick Twenty Five radio calling in airstrikes and actually conducting the ground warfare in the LZ uh, because the Arvin officer, uh, Major, just, Jerry knew what he was doing. Uh, Jerry was the one that eventually said, we got, we got to halt this because there's too much crap going on in here. And, and uh, Kirk Lauder uh, obviously took, took it and we stopped, stopped the insertion for a while and went back and, Picked it back up again later on in the afternoon. Uh, that morning, I uh, <clears throat> we got hit by a rocket propelled grenade, as as you've des- described. The gaping hole in the windshield hit the windshield strut. It was shot at about a forty five degree angle, so when it hit the windshield, it exploded out instead of exploding in. Um, crew chief said, "Sir, sir, sir, get the ass out of here! Get the ass out of here, sir, sir." sir. The enunciator panel, which is all our control warning lights, looked like a Christmas tree lit up. Um, and we took off. At, at within within several seconds, we started feeling uh, harshness in the controls. Um, the hydraulic system warning light was blinking. Um, and within, within another short amount of time, we lost all hydraulics. It took both of us uh, on the controls to uh, – it's like going down the highway at 85 miles an hour and the power steering goes out and uh, you're coming up on some major curves. Uh, it took us both on the controls. Um, we were finally able to get it back in, called emergency at Quezon. Um, we were like number two or three emergency at that time. Guys ahead of us who had gotten blown up on Lolo. And uh, we got it down. We uh, we had to make a low slow into and we thought, God, we're going to get shot out of the sky just trying to get in to land at, at, uh, on the Pierce Steel Planking Runway at Quezon. But, my God, it was a textbook landing. Uh, and we were able to get her down. And, and uh, no sooner than we got it down, I asked the aircraft to do some half of the chain, pull, pull the aircraft right off the, 
Ralph Runway getting ready for another another person calling emergency. I remember uh, Colonel Fernander, Bobby Fernander. He was our uh, battalion commander, 101st Aviation Battalion, which was part of the 101st Aviation Group, commanded by Colonel Davis. You'll see Davis's name in that book. Fernander is also mentioned in that book. But Fernander comes out and uh, sort of throws his arms around us like, God, I'm so glad you guys made it. And uh, he said, come on, there's, a, there's another briefing going on in the tent. So um, we all ran over to the big briefing tent. And uh, and your your aircraft was, is it, is it the correct word, totaled? Do you, yeah, it couldn't be flown again. Couldn't be flown again. Yeah, yeah. Now, whether they hooked it out of there and got it repaired or what, but it, it shot out hydraulics. We had 47 holes in that aircraft that morning. We counted the holes in the aircraft, 47 holes and lost hydraulics. And the- uh, Any of you guys, any of your guys get wounded in the aircraft? None. Isn't that amazing? <sighs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I mean, it just, it, it just blows my mind. But Fernando uh, came out, and I thought it was interesting. Here's a lieutenant colonel coming out, and it's like, welcome us home, and hurry up, we've got to get in the briefing tent. we got this thing. And we had a briefing tent for the – we were in the briefing tent. Kirk Lauder, all were – Kirk Lauder was commanded 223rd uh, Aviation uh, Battalion. And uh, he told us about the afternoon mission. We've got to get back in there. We've got more troops to insert into Lolo. And, and uh, Colonel Fernando looked at me and he said, well, I'm sure you want to go in there and fly. Two of your, two of your crews are on the ground in there. I said, yes, sir, I certainly do, but I, I don't have an aircraft. He said, well, take mine. I said, sir, he said, take mine. But the only thing, you've got to take my crew chief with you. And, uh, and then he pulled me aside and he said, now listen, that's a brand new aircraft. Don't you bring that thing back the way you brought yours back this morning? I said, yes, sir. Well, you didn't obey that order very well, did you? No, because I... 58 holes in his aircraft when we got back that so we, afternoon. We were able to rescue the guys off the ground. So talk us through that. So so you launch again to go back into this is, by the way, this is LZ Lolo. You call it Lulu? Lolo. Lolo. Yeah, it's named after uh, Lola, uh, Lola Brigida. They were all named after. Liz was after Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, what was the other one? Uh, but, uh, but, uh, I can't think of her name right now. Uh, but they were all named after Hollywood starlets. But... Uh, so you get, the bri- you get the briefing of, okay, we got guys on the ground. We yeah. got to go back in there. Yeah. And, and you and just have 47 holes in your aircraft. That morning. You saw a bunch of your friends get shot down. You saw a bunch of other aircraft get shot down that are sitting in the LZ now. Yep. You get brought in the briefing room. Hey, you got to go again. <laughs> you say, I don't have an aircraft. Aircraft. The boss says, you can take mine. <laughs> Brand, didn't even have 25 hours on it yet. Brand new Huey. And... The only one caveat, you got to take my crew chief. Okay. Uh, so uh, we get to start, to, we get to signal, okay, let's, let's crank them. Oh, and by the way, uh, uh, there was no unit integrity anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean, every, we were just all kind of a whole big unit. Like whoever could, whoever could get in company. a bird, whoever could go. And so uh, we take off, uh, we, st- we have troops on board. We take off, we put put those troops on the ground, uh, and I'm hovering around for a few seconds to make sure that our guys have gotten off. They were picked up by common chairs in front of me, uh, but I wanted to make sure that we had everybody off the ground. And by that time, we're, as you described, the hammer taps on the screen. They were, I mean, it was just all over. And, and it's like I, I said earlier, some people say, what was it like? I said, uh, take your bare hand and grab a wasp nest full of wasp. That's what it was like. And uh, so, again, the same scenario, taking all these hits. Thank God didn't get hit by an RPG. Uh, but the enunciator panel, listing all the uh, circuit. Uh, if, a, if a major system goes down or is damaged, you have a little light that flashes on. And on that light, it says, for example, hydraulics. So you know something's happened to your hydraulic system. Uh, tail rotor. You no, know something's happened to your tail rotor. So, uh, but the one that got me that started flashing was <coughs> main rotor transmission. What does that one mean? What, transmission. The, the, oh, the transmission. Main the, rotor. Yeah, okay. So it means what it says. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, we got her back on the ground. We were able to come to the hover. We put it down at caisson. And the main rotor locked. 
seized, turned the chopper almost 270 degrees around from our landing head. <laughs> there were actually Bell Tech reps up at Quezon looking at damage and what, because they were writing their reports for, hey, this, this is what we need to improve on, on the newer models of the Huey. They were writing their reports. The guy told me, he said, sir, you're very lucky. He said, you could have had that transmission could have seized in the air. He said, you guys wouldn't be here. And it seized on the ground. Fernando came over. <laughs> <laughs> 58 holes in an aircraft. <laughs> and a locked, seized transmission. And a seized transmission. That that uh, that helicopter uh, obviously didn't fly again that day. <laughs> That's two of them. One day, we uh, like I say we'd lost a lot of aircraft that day, and it was getting nighttime. Uh, we had this guy that liked to fix this stuff called Comanchero stew, and uh, there were <laughs> on Quezon. There was actually wild onions that you could pull out of the ground. And uh, he and a bunch of guys had collected that. And he always kept this pot and poured a can of water in this pot and throw those things, then put a bunch of sea rations in there and stir all that stuff up. And, and uh, you know, anything tastes good with Texas peat on it. And uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we were all, he had all that stuff done. And, you know, we were, everybody was sort of sitting around. I think he had some paper plates or something with him. And, you know, you eat with your fingers and all that stuff. And we were all sort of gathered around there waiting for uh, Major Claw to come over and tell us what our, you know, next missions were. We'd lost, uh, we took 10 aircraft up that morning. And uh, we lost, well, we lost, if, if you count 11 aircraft, Colonel Fernandez Bird, uh, we lost seven. Um, we did have one one uh, gunner hit, uh, but you know, purple heart wound, but superficial. Uh, but still, he got hit. You know, mm -hmm. that's that's bad stuff. But um, we're sitting there, uh, sort of gathering around, and uh, all of a sudden, we see coming towards us a figure, just tall and lean, and and uh, just and I and I got the glint of the stars on his helmet. And so he got closer to us. Uh, he just, he was the epitome of spit shine boots. And it was General Sidbury. And he came over and he said, uh, I just want to tell you, comment sheriffs, what a great job he did today. And uh, he said, uh, I, I don't want to disturb your child. And we said, well, sir, come on, have, have some child. He said, no, that, that's your child. I grab something to eat up here. But... I just wanted you all to know what a great job you did today. And uh, with that, he said, uh, Colonel Fernando, I'm, I'm going to release you all for the night. So we all jumped on the four remaining aircraft and came back to Camp Eagle. There's a section in here in, in the book where um, that gets described a little bit. You're on this flight back to Camp Eagle. And I'm going to the book here. It says, sitting mesmerized on the floor of one of the Hueys was Captain J. Tate, Comanchero 26. Tate, the second flight platoon leader, was deep in thought, having lost two aircraft this day to enemy fire. The flight was at 6,000 feet, flying over, a, uh, flying over a cloud overcast with the sun projecting the aircraft shadow on the cloud below them. In addition, a halo appeared around the shadow. He was sitting in the doorway behind the right seat pilot with a set of headphones that the crew chief had given him. Wondering to himself why he and his crew had survived this horrendous day, he heard a voice say to him, don't worry, Jay, you're going to be okay. He looked up to see who was talking to him. No one was. Each passenger was lost in their own thoughts. He heard the voice again, don't worry, Jay, you're going to be okay. Just then, Amazing Grace played on the Armed Forces Vietnam radio network. And there's a footnote here that says, One week later, Jay received a letter from his mother. 
She related a dream she had had the night before in which Jay's father had told her, don't worry, Jay, you are going to be okay. The letter was dated 4 March. Jay still has the letter. touching yeah that's uh that's an amazing amazing story emotional uh, I watched that shadow we were actually flying between two layers of clouds <clears throat> the sun broke through the upper layer and cast a shadow and of course the heat of the chopper the coolness of that altitude it forms sort of a rainbow effect around that shadow. And uh, it, the the crew chief actually didn't lend me a set of earphones. I had my flight helmet on mm. and had it plugged in listening to AFVN because I had been talking about, he said, uh, there's a major action or, or major war going on up in our And he said, uh, he said, uh, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of helicopters uh, uh, destroyed, and uh, said I want to play this next song for these guys. That's when he played Amazing Grace, yeah. and uh, I, I can tell you, as I sit here right now, I heard that voice. And to get that letter. And to hear my mom and to hear her read her words that she thought dad was telling her, don't worry, Jay's going to be okay. And she woke my dad up and dad said, oh, honey, you're dreaming. Go back to sleep. She said, no, you said, did you tell me Jay's going to be okay? He said, honey, don't worry. You're don't tell me there's not a God. Mm -hmm. I mean, if. I pretended to be a Christian at one time, but I tell you what, that afternoon I became a Christian. That's the only way I can say why I survived. And that's not to say those who died weren't. Because mm-hmm. I had prayed, God, I know I'm going to die. Just don't let me get shot up so bad my mother won't recognize me. And uh, I came home, a uh, changed person. When my mother died, uh, the uh, she had the same pastor. She passed away in 2010. Uh, she had relayed that story about the dream to her pastor, and he had made notes about that. And that was in his file. And during her celebration of life service, he he talked about that. Mm-hmm. When you um, got done, when you guys flew back to Camp Eagle, did you, what, did you stand down for the night and then you went back into it? Our flight ops guys were monitoring everything on our company frequency. And they had heard all the chaos and uh, the horror that was being dealt to us. And... um, so, of the 10 crew, we all came back on those four ships, because 11 ships if you count Colonel Fernandez's ship. Uh, they were all outside waiting for us to come in, waving their hats, <laughs> and we all landed. And they all ran up, and everybody was getting a hug, and Everybody was cold beer was on the on the flight line and uh, and it was just a big celebration and especially because we brought hell Morris and his crew and Berg and his crew Jerry Cruz we got them off of there and they were sitting on on the floor too <laughs> plugged in listening to something. Uh, that's the camaraderie 
And as, as I told uh, Matt Jackson, I, I said, uh, aviation crews are different. Uh, rank is superfluous. Uh, everybody is has a specific mission. Crew chief, door gunner, co-pilot, aircraft commander. Everybody has a specific mission. But nobody can do that one mission by themselves. It takes all of us working together as a team. And I don't care if I'm a captain and you're a spec four crew chief. I'm no better than you are. And if it wasn't for you, I couldn't be flying this airplane. Same with the door gunner. Uh, that's a lesson you learn out of it. You, le you learn a lot about team. You learn about personal courage. You learn about personal responsibility. Um, you learn uh, a certain sense of tenacity. You can't be lazy. Uh, you, you've, their dedication's got to be there. And that's what I experienced with these guys in Vietnam. Every one of them. There was no lacquered. Every one of them. Even the guys in the maintenance uh, hangar that didn't fly those missions with us. And many of them would jump in to fly a mission just to get out there and do it. But even to the clerk that wrote the awards up, there was such a sense of dedication and camaraderie that I have never experienced in my entire life since then. Never. Um, in my 20 years in uniform and uh, the 13 years that I was fortunate to serve as a civilian with the, with the Office of the Secretary of Defense, nothing, nothing will ever compare to what I experienced especially in Lamson 719. Uh, even the Command and Control North missions, though they were hairy, mm -hmm. though they had some <laughs> twists and turns I would have never expected. And, and, and we lost two crew on Command and Control North missions. Uh, that's, that's horrible. That, uh, but nothing compares with Lamson 719. And... Uh, I think that's that's where the what we now see as air assault. That's where it was born. Mm -hmm. It was born there. We had to think on our feet. We did things that weren't written down. We had to think on our feet, and uh, I mean, like coming to the ten foot hover versus putting your skids on the ground. How do you learn that? You learn it from experience. Um. Just, just things. I guess they're being learned today, uh, and more as they teach air assault at Fort Campbell today. Uh, but my God, that was. I went to a reunion at Fort Campbell several years back, and the guys are all flying Blackhawks now. Then they looked at us like. We were World War II pilots, flying B-29, with the low tech, all this. And they were captivated by the stories that we could tell. Um, you know, if it wasn't for GPS, I couldn't drive my car from point A to point B. But up in the air, I could shoot a vector and I could say pop smoke and identify the smoke and knew exactly where I was going. Uh, just things you learn. Um, probably one of the awards I'm most proud of is an Army Commendation Medal. And I got that from battalion commander. We inserted his soldiers into the Ashall Valley. Uh, this was after, uh, after 719. And it had been a long day for them. And uh, sun, it was start, sun was starting to set, and I get a call from... And I, and I something six, I can, and I answer the phone. He says, "Could you take a one more mission?" I said, "Well, yes, sir. Sure, sure, we can." I did call ops because they're expecting us. Uh, he said, "Well, I want to treat my troops to ice cream." 
and they've got ice cream and Burmite cans on our log pad back at Eagle. I said, not a problem, sir. And we flew an ice cream mission in there, and he awarded his troops for their hard work. <laughs> and I got an R call <laughs> for that. I bet you that ice cream tasted good. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, after that, I uh, went with Landon and LZ. Many times I'd get out of the cockpit and always wore spit shine boots. I, I, I was dressed right, dressed right in front the whole time. I always wore spit shine boots. But I made it a, my goal. I was going to get out of that damn cockpit. And I'd say, okay, Peter Pilot, you got it. Co pilot. And I'd help the troops unload supplies off the ship. And I, I want to think they appreciated that. Now here's an aviation captain getting out of the cockpit, and he's doing sweat work. That's what I learned in Vietnam. We had a, um, a, a, just an unbelievable relationship with 101st in the Battle of Ramadi. The, the first of the 506 was there. Yep. And um, can't, I could never say enough good things about their leadership and the soldiers on the ground. The fighting that they did was just uh, amazing, amazing courage. And uh, one of my guys, Mikey Monsoor, w- was killed doing a mission supporting them. And uh, when we got home, we went out and on their wall where they have the list of the soldiers that they lost in the Battle of Ramadi, they have Mikey's name up there with them. I think we're fortunate, Jocko. We're fortunate that we knew people like that. And there will be people who will go to their graves that never experience that kind of heroism, that kind of commitment, that kind of courage, that kind of teamwork, the camaraderie. They will never, ever experience it. And I think you and I are very fortunate that we've had that opportunity. Indeed. Wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, we, we, going back to, to, to Lam Son, once you had that, what, did they give you a night of rest and then you started flying missions again? Uh, I had two days down and then started flying again. It was after that that uh, during the resupplies when I think the Arvin knew that the NVA had a hell of a lot more confidence in their ability than the Arvin did. Um, it was after that, during, uh, doing those resupply missions in there, that, that I actually experienced them abandoning the battle space. Uh, I didn't experience that before Lamson 719. Uh, I always thought it was interesting when we would we'd go into a PZ uh, early in the morning, put the, put, it, put the choppers down, waiting for them to load up, the Arvin, the South Vietnamese, to load up. But I'd see them sitting there, and they had water in their still pots, and they were brushing their teeth. And it was like, this is extremely important that I brush my teeth. And I always thought, well, that's kind of interesting that, they're doing that personal hygiene, and they're going to pour the water out, put their helmet liners back in, put their helmets on, they're going to climb on board this aircraft, and God knows what faces them when they hit the LZ. Mm-hmm. But they made sure that their teeth were clean. Um, as this goes on, like you said, the the tide started to turn, and—, and uh, I think the goal became just to get to, how'd you say it, Chipone? Is that how they say it? Chipone. Chipone. The goal is to get there. They kind of got there like almost like playing tag, touched it, yeah, we made it, and then said, 
let's get out of here. And by the way, there was hardly anything there by then. <laughs> um, then and and then as the as the Arvin started to retreat, the the, the NVA stepped up the attacks even more, um, and it just slaughter. Yeah, and that's where I picked up the body bags with the dead Arvin soldiers in them. <sighs> Turns into a bit of a rout as the as the. Arvin are now leaving you know there's again I mean I'm just gonna a couple days here March 21st the the NVA the North Vietnamese attack their division attacks the second and third battalions US air support during the day included 788 Hilo gunship sorties 157 tactical airstrikes and 11 B-52 strikes Fast forward another day, March 23rd. 756 Hilo gunship sorties, 238 tactical airstrikes, 11 B-52 strikes. This is as they're kind of getting back to the border into South Vietnam. Correct. March 25th, finally, 45 days after the start of the operation, all the South Vietnamese forces are out of Laos. And well, so to speak, yeah, uh, yeah, stragglers, yeah. Um, I guess the ones that they are accounting for, yes. are back. <sighs> April 6th, the basic case on is under attack and it gets abandoned. And to your point earlier, on April 7th, so that's April 6th, the, the operation is over, case on is abandoned. April 7th, President Nixon declares, tonight I can report that Vietnamization has succeeded and announces a further withdrawal of 100,000 more troops. Friendly losses during this operation. Seven fixed wing planes, 108 helicopters lost, 618 helicopters damaged, 20% beyond repair, 32 artillery pieces captured, and these are South Vietnamese artillery pieces, South Vietnamese tanks, 71 of them. South Vietnamese armored vehicles, 163 of them. 37 half-tracks, 278 trucks destroyed. South Vietnamese loss, and I couldn't really come up with a great number on this, but it's between 5,000 and 15,000 men killed, wounded, or missing, depending on the source that you go to. Americans, 1,149 wounded, 38 missing in action, 215 killed in action. (sighs) You know, that's the second time we left Quezon. We left it in 68 mm-hmm. after the Marines got overrun. And here we go again. And you often hear combat soldiers say, we fought hard. We lost guys in our unit to take that hill. And after we took it, we left it. Now we have to go back and take it again. Mm-hmm. There it is. <sighs> when, so now this operation's over. I mean, did, did did attitude start to change? You're hearing Nixon saying that Vietnamization is working, and you see the you see the South Vietnamese fleeing the battlefield. What was the what was the attitude of you all? In my unit, and that's all I can speak for. Uh, the uh, esprit de corps never never ceased. We were still flying command and control north supporting those guys uh, and and their mission grew even more critical because they were there judging okay now that lamb Son's over what what's the paven the north vietnamese mm-hmm. army doing now where are they uh you know it was during that time uh 
Uh, shortly after I left, they overran Quan Tri Dong Ha. Uh, Evans uh, was certainly within their site, Camp Evans, which was uh, north of uh, Camp Beagle, the 101st headquarters. Um, but I never saw uh, any sense of uh, uh, behavior that said, okay, well, 719 is over. Uh, I guess the war's over. Uh, I never saw that mm-hmm. attitude. Um, our soldiers uh, remain very professional soldiers. And that's amazing because many of them are just 19 years old. Some of them are 18. I had a warrant officer of 21. I mean, I was an old dude. I was 25. Um, I, I never, never once questioned uh, our, our ability as an aviation unit to do the job, the mission that we were assigned to do, even after, even up until the day I left. When I became the operations officer my last four months in country, I, I got a chance to look at at the battle space in a different way because I would go to battalion and battalion ops and look at that and then come back and put that into company ops and and um, work our portion of the mission, our company's portion of the battalion mission. And uh, I'd bring the guys into the briefing room, the guys are going to be flying that mission, and I'd say, okay, this is our objective right here. Now, how do we get there? We're here. This is our objective. Our mission is this. we got to put so many troops in there. How do we get there? And usually it wasn't just one place. It was if it was um, a company plus, it would be maybe three different places mm-hmm. we'd have to go. And I never would say, okay, this is how we're going to do it. Mm-hmm. You're going to do it. I'd say, okay, how do we get there? What, what's the best approach to make this happen? And I was the operations officer. And I'd have these young warrant officers. Oh, let's do this today. And somebody said, No, no, we can't do that. We got to do this. Somebody said, Well, let's do it this way. Well, okay. Well, let's take a piece of that. Next thing you know, they had planned the operation. All I did was approve it. Mm-hmm. But that—that's a leadership skill that I learned from people like Colonel Bobby Fernander who never said, you're going to do it this way. He always sort of facilitated, if you will, facilitative leadership. And that's what you're seeing now in business, facilitative leadership, getting people involved. And if the more you're involved, the more you take ownership. Mm -hmm. And that's what I saw in our guys. That's what I saw in our guys during Lamson. That's what I saw in our guys after Lamson. Now, when we were flying command and control north, we did what they told us to do. (laughs) (laughs) They had a very specific way of doing things, and that's the way we were going to do it. And that's fine. And that's fine. But this is the way we did it. Um, And I mirrored my leadership style after people that I had great respect for. Uh, to include General Hal Moore, who became Lieutenant General Hal Moore, uh, and the way that the camaraderie, the, the so, not camaraderie, uh, I don't want to say I was buddy buddy with General Moore because I was not, but we had a we had a relationship in the cockpit, and I think he respected my desires, what I wanted to do. Obviously, he did because I wouldn't have gone to Nam <laughs> had it not been for that. Yeah, but, I, don't, I don't know if you didn't have a relationship with Hal Moore, but. Geez, if you were friends with him, who knows what he would have done for you? <laughs> what a great man he was. But but I left I left Vietnam feeling very good about uh, my unit and about what we did. Um, I did change my views a bit to think that my tour in Nam will be successful if I can do things to support my U.S. troops. So that changed from supporting the whole concept of Vietnamization. For example, if I can bring ice cream out to those troops after they've busted their butt all day inserting, then I've done something that I can be proud of. 
and uh, and that's where my mind sort of changed after being in country for about eight months uh, to support my soldiers mm-hmm. and uh, to do what I could to bring them home. Yeah, the the leadership stuff you're talking about, that's exactly the, the best leaders I had was they would tell us what the mission was, what the goal was, and then say come up with a plan, and that's what I always tried to do myself. That certainly is the, the uh, best way to get the people on board with the plan is just let them come up with it. That's right. You don't have to convince them of anything. It's their idea. It's their plan. Let them argue it out. Yeah. Yep. So when you did, uh, so what? What? When? When did you leave Vietnam? It was in uh, October of '71, and uh, in Nam there was four officers that lived in the same hooch. Um, we all had our little private rooms at the corner of this rectangular hooch. Then the center was our common area. And we had a little stove in the common area and so on. But um, right across from me was um, an officer, Stan Dodge. He was coming to a 1 8. And uh, so when we would fly, when I knew he was flying and going to be in the air, then how, he and I would choose a frequency. Uh, uh, that we would come up on just and would fly, follow with each other in the air. So I was sort of looking after each other, you know, in the air. So uh, I came back from, from Nam. It's, it's a very interesting story. Uh, there was me as a Comanchero, and then there were three other pilots who were Kingsmen. They were in Bravo Company, 101st Aviation, which was our sister company. And uh, we all knew each other. And we all came back. We were in our khakis wearing our flight jackets and you know we thought our sierra didn't stink <laughs> and we get back into seattle tacoma and uh got walked through the airport nobody spitting on us nobody yelling at us nobody calling us baby killers and we got a taxi we come into uh and we say hey uh, is there a holiday inn he says yeah there's one downtown so he takes us to the holiday inn we all check in our rooms we clean up we come down to the bar to meet before we go have some dinner. We get to the bar. Of course, we're all, you know, we're all got flight pay. They've paid us before we leave Nam, and, you know, we're all loaded with money, <laughs> more than we should have had. And we get into the bar, and the bartender said, what be for you guys? And go to have our flight jackets on, you know. And we're feeling kind of smug. And, and we all order drinks, and. One of them said, "Hey, everybody else is drink their next drink. It's on all of it's on us." So we all threw in money and we bought everybody in the bar that was sitting there their next drink. And there was a, a couple. He was playing piano and she was singing. And uh, they were like the uh, oh, what's that? The Carpenters. Okay. <laughs> That's and she was singing. They were doing all the Carpenter song and. Uh, so she dedicated a special song to us. She says, he says, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, but uh, the next drink that all of y'all uh, will get tonight are from these four guys standing at the bar in uniform. They all just returned from Vietnam. And uh, let's give them a round of applause. They all stood up, gave us a round of applause. And uh, then she said, I'm going to dedicate this next song to these guys. And it was very special. And uh, we didn't buy another drink that night uh we all had steaks they were all paid for uh and it they quit playing at one o'clock and this guy came up to us and said hey we're a bunch of us are here on an insurance convention uh we'd like to take you all out for breakfast so they took us out to breakfast and we all got to bed about five o'clock in the morning and uh then we all flew out our separate ways the next day but was telling you about Stan Dodge. Stan's uh, parents lived in uh, Arizona, Tucson. And uh, he said, uh, and he had left country about a month before I did. So he said, I want to have a little gathering at my house if, if you don't mind staying over one day before you make it back. So I flew into, into Tucson. And uh, he had a, a couple donut dollies 
there who were in the 101st. Uh, they were there. In fact, Stan married one of the donut dollars, Barbara. Uh, and Terry Deegan was a friend of mine. She was there. And plus uh, uh, one guy from Bravo Company, the Kingsman, and, and another pilot. Uh, but we partied hardy that night, and Stan's parents just did a wonderful job of uh, making us feel at home and, and so on. And uh, might have been there two nights I stayed because I had to have time to get my uniform cleaned up before I wore it home. I wanted to make sure it was strack when my parents <laughs> saw me. And uh, so I got my uniform, got my shoes all spit shy and everything, and caught the plane out of Phoenix. And uh, Terry was with me. and. Terry and I had a really nice relationship. I mean, it wasn't a sexual thing. It was just a nice relationship. We understood each other. And she had left Nam two months before I did, and she would write me letters telling me about how the world back in the States was not the world. It was not the real world to her. Real world to her. What she experienced in Vietnam with the soldier thing, that was the real world. And we'd, we would write back and forth about that. And uh, I flew, my flight took us, she was from Downers Grove, Illinois. So we flew to Chicago, and then I was a catch plane from Chicago to Charlotte. And uh, she wanted me to meet her parents, and, and I wanted to meet her parents too. And um, yeah, I could have probably had a relationship with, with Terry uh, that would have gone beyond. She ended up marrying an Army Ranger uh, several years later that she had known and not. But I uh, kept waiting for her parents to come, and my flight was coming up to go, and her parents hadn't shown up yet. And I never did get to meet her parents. We finally gave a hug and kissed goodbye, and I got on the plane and flew to Charlotte, and that's where my parents met me. Uh, but I, I think having those couple days to, to decompress mm-hmm. before I got home, it's probably psychologically good for me. Yeah, that's uh, well, one thing they always point out. World War Two, the guys when the war was over, they got on ships and sailed home together for four weeks or six weeks, and they got to decompress and tell stories and get stuff off their chest and whatever. And in, in Vietnam, it was like, oh, you're in Vietnam today, and then the next day you're home and you don't have your friends with you, and yeah. you're in a random, you know, main town USA or Main Street USA, and that that can be a challenge. So let's fast forward. Uh, um, I was home 30 days, reassigned to Fort Dix, New Jersey. Um, not in aviation. Uh, I was actually working for a facility that uh, processed AWOL and deserter soldiers that were brought back into the Army. Um, but every Friday night, all the aviators, they'd go home, take off their fatigues, put on their flight suits, would all gather around and – one little portion of the officer club bar and would sit there and we'd reminisce and tell war stories and and uh it got emotional at times and we'd smack him on the back oh come on i'll buy you another beer you know but that's a part of the decompression Mm -hmm. and that those were very special times to sit there and talk about that and people have often asked me well what kind of problems did you have and i said well i really didn't have any problems when I came back and and they you know well, well God you must have been tough I said well no I wasn't tough I said I think it's just the process of what how we all would get together and talk about our experiences and I said these guys that came back from Nam after being in combat especially infantry guys grunts as we call them uh, they would come back they would go to Fort Lewis they process out of the army then they'd go home and they didn't have an opportunity to sit around, and and many of those were subjected to some very harsh treatments when they when they arrived home. And I never had, fortunately, never had that experience. Um, so I think the Army's learning a lot of that. All the services are learning a lot about that. About how do we take care of our veterans after they've been? I mean, you were in a hell of a lot of horrific situations uh, that that could have mentally had a had a horrible impact on you but you've worked through that yourself jockey yeah i mean i think um i I always talk about the fact that i've talked about it written about it 
um, talk to my friends about it. And I think that's like you said, it's what you kind of got to do. And you know, the, I look back now in the first, the, from my last deployment for, to Ramadi, um, we got home and <laughs> we were, we were, we, we were pretty, um, yeah, what's a good word here? We were pretty wild when we got back. <laughs> we were pretty yeah. wild when we got back. Yeah. And, and, but you know, we kept it under, you know, we kept, we looked out for each other, made sure that we were wild <laughs> without, you know, doing anything that's going to cause irreparable damage or cause some kind of major significant problem. But we were definitely wild. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And then, you know, I don't know if it was maybe six months, maybe a year or something like that. You know, we started getting back to kind of, just doing what we were doing a little bit more normal, but yeah, we were we were pretty wild when we got back. Well, you know, uh, if my if my my excuse was, I was well, you got pretty drunk last night. I said, well, hell, I'm an aviator. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we we had some. You know, we all kind of a bunch of us lived in the kind of the same area too, same little neighborhood. And yeah, so we, we, yeah, we would go out, we'd meet up, and. We go. We go pretty hard. <laughs> I think. Uh, I think for me, I'm, I'm still. Uh, it, it's amazing. The older I get now, and I'll be 76 in August. Um, the the memories become more vivid now. Um, I dream about this more. Um, I'm hearing from people. We have a we have our own Comanchero website. Um, and uh, you can tell by the comments that Lamson 719 had a major, major psychological impact on our guys. And there were some guys that measured their time in service. Oh, I was, oh, I came after 719, mm-hmm. or I left just before 719. So, see, that 719 became an anchor um, uh, uh, to describe where one was at one's time uh, flying with uh, the common cheros. Um, and uh, when uh, when Matt called me up and asked me would I uh, do some collaboration on this book, uh, in some ways I was pleased, in some ways I was uh, a little frightened to bring up uh, – the experiences. And I'll be perfectly honest, I had a lot of anxiety coming here today. Um, though I have read this book and a number of times read Undaunted Valor 719 quite a few times. I've earmarked it. Uh, I've read after action reports on it that, that hopefully Matt, and he did, he had some of these uh, after action reports. Uh, that he took his data from. Um, But still, sitting here uh, now and talking about it with you, and you weren't there, uh, I can talk about it with somebody that was there and uh, and not have anxiety, but you weren't there. And I often wonder, I'm telling you this, but what are you actually hearing? Because you weren't there. Mm-hmm. And you can tell me about what you did. And I can listen to it. But I wasn't there. And so there's a difference. Yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. there's always going to be a little gap or a big gap depending on, you know, the person's experiences. And, you know, what one thing I think is interesting about, you know, when you start talking about coming home and what you're going through, I think the one thing that's good is, if people actually understand what they're feeling a little bit, and I, I remember like you get a new guy that's overseas, and I'd look at a new guy that's overseas, and you could tell they're nervous, right? And you know, just say something like, hey man, you you're, you know you're, that feeling you get in your stomach? And they'd be like, y- you know, trying not to tell you, but then they'd admit yeah, to it. Yeah. And I go, yeah, you're just nervous. It's your, it's your body getting ready to go fight. It's, it's totally normal. That's what you should feel like. And they'd be like, oh, okay. Oh, you! Oh, by the way, you won't be able to sleep tonight because we got an operation tomorrow. You're not gonna be able to sleep tonight. So that's just the way it is. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and I think it's the same thing coming home. You know, it's like, oh, 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 you're gonna get, you're gonna get sad sometimes. 
This doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean you're uh, trapped in the past. It just means you miss your friends, and that's okay. And so if you are thinking about something and it, and it makes you cry, hey, yeah, that's what, that's what happens. You know, it's, yeah. that's the way it is. And I think if people understand that, that that's, that that's normal, then they go, oh, okay, well, that's, that's just what's going to happen. It's okay. And I think when people don't think it's normal and all of a sudden they think I can't control my emotions or I'm scared or I'm, I'm sad and I shouldn't be sad and I shouldn't be scared, it's like, no, it's, it's fine. No big deal. That's just the way it is. You, you, you do your job. You, you know, you're going to be scared. You got, the, you got the queasy stomach. You can't sleep at night. Okay, cool. Yeah, guess what? There's a bunch of other guys that's not, not sleeping tonight either. No big deal. No big deal. Oh, you get home, you, you, you're going to feel sad. You're going to miss your friends. Yeah, we, we all miss them. That, that's the way it is. That, that's okay. And I think that helps people out a lot to be able to just say, oh, okay, what I'm feeling is not an isolated thing. It's just the way human beings process the, the tough experiences that they go through. But you know, we, we both served in the kind of service that at one time you didn't show that emotion. Yeah. And you weren't expected to. I think the service, and I hope, I've read that they have, I've seen interviews that they have, that now that's being taken into consideration. It's okay to express what you're feeling right now. Uh, it's okay to go seek counseling because it's not going to end up on your officer efficiency report or your annual report or whatever report you're going to get. Um, and so I think that has been a great improvement with the way we receive uh, our warfighting men and women, uh, especially those who have come back and, and been engaged in combat. Uh, one thing I'll say uh, about the getting excited and, and nervous about the upcoming mission, uh, and I would do the same thing in Vietnam. I mean, people say, were you scared? I said, well, hell yeah, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> but, but hey, you know, this is what we signed up to do, and this is, this is what we're going to do. And a lot, a lot of times, I mean, I said that trying to convince myself. But, see, I was a platoon commander. I, I couldn't sit there and tell my troops, oh, my God, I'm scared to death. Mm -hmm. uh -uh. I had to put on the show. I had to do that. But the interesting thing about it is once we strapped on that helicopter and we took off in flight, all of that drained. Yeah. It all drained. I mean, it never amazed me. You got a job to, to do. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you were busy. You were monitoring three radios. You were, you know, talking to the crew there. I mean, it all drained. I mean, even going into, even going into Lola th that morning when we were doing 90 knots approaching, we should have been done 60 or 40, and we were coming in there and but you cycle that thing back and that damn nose pitches up and you're saying oh hell I hope my tail rudder doesn't hit the ground and then you put that sucker down and you're taking fire all over the place you don't have time to be scared you you you, re, you react by the training that mm -hmm. you've had and by God that training was good yeah yeah exactly and that's uh, I think the same way everybody feels I mean if you're gonna be nervous it's usually before an operation and for me I was always just more nervous about my my friends my guys that's what I was always worried about hey I hope nothing happens to the guys you know uh, but then once for us it's once the breach goes you know or once the once the breach goes now it's on everybody knows we're here we're doing what we're yeah, doing yeah. you know once we leave the gate front gate you're you're doing your job and there's no time to think about that you can't you can't waste any mental capacity thinking about what could happen or what might go happen because you got to do your job and you don't want to have anything else in your head besides hey what do i need to do right now how can i do my best job right now that's what i'm thinking about uh but again i seen some nervous new guys <laughs> and just hey man it's all right no big deal and and i think that helps people a lot just like anything anytime you can give somebody a heads up about what's about to happen or what and I've had this feeling with uh, train training MMA fighters mixed martial arts fighters to go and fight and I saw the exact same thing this is kind of where I started putting it together oh I, I tell them hey oh your stomach a little queasy yeah I'm super nervous yeah you're supposed to be you're getting ready to go into a fight yeah. it's okay and that would put them at ease because they'd realize oh this is just normal this is just me getting ready to go into you know that form of sporting combat 
So I think it's, uh, but 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 to add to that, I think it's good to be a little nervous for sure, because you're more on your game for sure, and uh, and that's one thing. Uh, that's one thing General John uh, Myers told me. Uh, he was a mentor of mine, and uh, later on in my service, and uh, he was the one that actually encouraged me to take the civilian position with the Sec Def, because um, I was doing uh, strategic planning work for him um, after I had retired from the uniform service, and uh, we had this we, we had this big uh, strategic planning conference coming up, and. Uh, I said, sir, I'd like to bring Doctor So and So in from George Washington University. Um, uh, he's been uh, he's been a a big critical thinker. Um, he sort of plans. Okay, this is where we have to be. How do we get there? Kind of a thing because uh, we were doing strategic planning. Uh, you know, the vision is where you want to be. Now, how do we go from where we are today to make that vision a reality? And uh, he said, uh, How long have you been working for me? I said, yeah, about two years, sir. He said, do you have a PhD? I, I said, no, sir, it's a master's degree. He said, well, I trust you. I don't know this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's, that's a leadership style that, that breeds confidence in your soldiers, in your employees. I got confidence in you. I don't know this guy. <laughs> so, Dr. What's his name? I never hired him to come in and do some work for us. But that made me feel great. Yeah. So, how much longer did you do in the Army before you retired? Uh, um, like I say, I spent 20 years in uniform, 68 to 88. Um, then I um, immediately, uh, before that, General Myers had, was talking to me about, he said, you're never going to make colonel god branch transferred from infantry to the army's as a general corps which is administrative corps of the army and uh he said uh i want you to take this job the sec def has been impressed with work you've been doing and uh he said your office will be here with me but you'll be working out of the office of the sec def and at that time i was with the defense communications agency which became now the Defense Information Systems Agency. But my office was there. I had clients all, military clients all over. It wasn't just uh, communications guys. <clears throat> Undersec Def was one of my clients. Um, the uh, uh, SYNC, U.S. Atlantic Command, General Jack Sheehan. I don't know if you've met General Sheehan or uh, General Sheehan, or an outstanding, outstanding warrior, great leader. Uh, General Mike Steele, who commanded uh, uh, U.S. Army Pacific, uh, just a tremendous guy. The Undersecretary of Defense for Logistics, I got a chance to do strategic planning work for him. Quite a few organizations in NATO, uh, two organizations that shape. Uh, and that's, that's all because of a guy by the name of John Myers that supported me and paved the way for me. And he believed in me. And uh, though I had a, <coughs> didn't have a Ph.D., he trusted me. Is that what leaders are for? Indeed. And then how long did you how long did you do that for? Thirteen years. And then you then went I, into what full retirement? Not then quite. I, well, then I uh, I was offered a position in the in civilian career in the steel business, and um, I was uh, executive vice president of a, a steel center. Um, stayed there from '01 to '09. Thought I'd retire. Uh, went into the insurance business for a little bit. Uh, wasn't exciting. Uh, then I decided to retire. And now my fiance uh, is still uh, working. Uh, she represents uh, a company called Hancock and Moore. It's all custom made furniture. Uh, some of the most high quality furniture you will ever find. It's all custom made to to your specifications. Uh, leather, uh, upholstery, uh, nails, finish, frames. You pick out the whole thing yourself, and they build it to your specifications. Uh, she also represents a line called Jessica Charles and a line called uh, Maitland Smith. And our territory is in North Carolina, uh, so we never go out of North Carolina. But, uh, yeah, I say I'm retired, but uh, 
now I run with Jan and and I take my orders from her <laughs> and uh so we uh we man her territory that's outstanding and she's enjoying uh staying here today because she has n- nothing she has to do that's a beautiful thing a little vacation day for her. little vacation day Hey, before we stop, I know there's a couple things that uh, just to mention here. What can you give us the update? I know that I know that Colonel Jackson's been working to to sort of turn this into a movie, turn at least some of these books into a movie. Uh, I know there's a GoFundMe page out there. What well, what's the update on 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 these uh, opportunities? Okay, well, yes, um, as people should probably know, it takes a lot of money to produce a movie. However, Undaunted Valor, Lamson 719, is going to be the movie. And it's our story of those of us who flew in it, who supported it. Uh, we need to have this on the big screen. And uh, it's Colonel Jackson's desire, as well as, as mine, that this not become a Hollywood flash in the pan movie. This is going to be... Uh, an action-filled movie because Lamson 719 was action. And he wants the movie to depict what actually happened. And uh, if anyone reads the book, they will know that if the movie depicts a quarter of what's in that book, it is going to be on the edge of your seat kind of a movie. So the events and everything that he's put into this thing are not Hollywood made-up events. These are true events. He's changed some names, but these are true events. Um uh, he does have uh, several uh, actors uh, who have uh, indicated that uh, they would like to play major roles in the movie. Uh, there's already a producer on board, and the screenwriters uh, are busy writing this. But it takes money to do this, and the GoFundMe, Undaunted Valor, is the place where people who hear this and feel that they want this story told whether it's them themselves or their relatives who are involved in this, or they are just um, very supportive of what our military has done in the past, especially what, what we did in Vietnam, which a lot of those stories were not very favorable stories. Uh, this is a very favorable story of what we did. Uh, then I encourage them to do the GoFundMe uh, Undaunted Valor. Um, all this money uh, is going to uh, being uh, – accepted by a 501c3 group uh, at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Um, And so Matt gets none of this money. Matt Jackson gets none of this money. It's all going towards uh, this movie. Uh, Every last cent off is going towards this movie. Um, So uh, the quicker we can get this in, the more we can, faster we can proceed with developing this movie. And uh, I would certainly encourage uh, people to take this in consideration. 501c3 so your donation is tax deductible that's outstanding and and i look forward to uh i look forward to seeing this thing for sure when it comes out reading these books sitting here we're talking with you guys this is just an unbelievable part of history and a true look at at the heroism that you all and american soldiers displayed in vietnam uh echo charles yes sir do you have any questions i do not no questions yeah. from Echo Charles. If he doesn't ask any questions, then that means he's going to talk a lot later. So I have to put up with that. But that's just the way it is. That's part of the punishment, I guess, for me. No, no, it's just, it just shows the depth that we went into and, you know, how fulfilled I am at the end. Okay. You know, to, down to the detail. Right well, on. I want to thank you for uh, asking me to be here. And I want to thank Matt Jackson for putting it all together. And, and uh, I'm finally glad to meet the man that I saw on uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, Dan Bongino show. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Uh, anything else, Jay? No, sir. Well, again, like you said, thanks to Colonel Matt Jackson for introducing us and, and for his efforts in writing these books and preserving these these heroic deeds of our combat aviators and soldiers in the Vietnam War. And, of course, thank you for joining us and sharing your experiences, your lessons learned, and most important, thank you, Thank you for your service and sacrifice to our great nation. The bravery of you, of your fellow pilots, of the of the air crews, the bravery that you all showed can never be questioned. And we are grateful for your heroism and the example that you set for all of us today. 
Thank you. Thanks for coming on. And with that, Major J. Tate has left the building. Not even much to say to follow that up. Just, just mayhem. I have a lot to say, actually, but I won't go into as deep as maybe I could. But I will say this. I was talking to Nick mm-hmm. outside. And whatever we were talking about, it reminded me of this, where, like, nowadays, it, okay, not nowadays, but in the Vietnam War, mm-hmm. there are so many people who did so many crazy things, but they don't have necessarily a big spotlight on them. Mm-hmm. They're just like, just kind of cruising now where you don't, you know, they don't, they're not in the spotlight in any way. They're just like, essentially yeah. now they're just sort of just living normal people. Well, it's always interesting to me that like uh, major J Tate retired in 1988. I came in in 1990, yeah. right? So there's a almost overlap there. Yeah. And uh, there's been plenty of old Vietnam guys in the SEAL teams, some, but you know, I'd be meeting some random army dude, you know, yeah. and he could have easily been this guy, you know? There are people in Vietnam that did the craziest stuff and no one knows about it. Literally things that are gonna be in a movie. Literally did those things. Things that are gonna be in a movie and people will be like, oh, I wonder why they wrote it, made it so crazy. All crazy, yeah. yeah. Yeah, where they gotta suspend their disbelief or what is that suspension? Yeah. They kinda gotta do that about something that really happened in real life, Yeah, that kind. Meanwhile, he's just cruising. I mean, even I was talking to Tilt yesterday, Hell yeah. Or actually Saturday. I was talking to Tilt on Saturday. And and he was, you know, the amount of times that those guys did crazy things, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And no one really knew too much about SOG. I mean, look, if you were if you're deeply into the military history and all that, but a normal everyday person yeah. barely knows anything about SOG. Yeah, I didn't for sure. There's one thing you mentioned that was pretty dark. And then you just moved right on. When he's like, you just you don't want to get burned up. Oh yeah, as a pilot. You, well, yeah, that guys, was in the book. That was in the book, Lam Son Seven Nineteen. Yeah, he said how like in World War Two, like some men World were War known. I, yeah, the World War One before parachutes. Yeah, you carry I'll a pistol. There. If you're gonna catch fire, you're just gonna kill yourself. <sighs> That's how yeah. bad it was. Yeah, that was interesting, and it was also interesting in in the first book by Matt Jackson. He's explaining, you know, basically that a helicopter doesn't want to fly. Yeah, yeah. This thing does. This is a bunch of metal, gear, and oil, gears and oil and gas that doesn't want to fly. If you just let it go, it's just going to crash. An airplane, even if you let go of the controls, it's going to kind of cruise. You know. Yeah, you kind of feel like I. I'm not a pilot. I don't know if you knew that, but it, it feels like on an, in an airplane, something goes wrong or whatever. As long as you got wings and the and the tail, you can kind of just yeah. glide that boy in. Yeah, it feels yeah. like that. So I had a car. So my first deployment to Guam, back in the day. <laughs> when we get over there, all the all the seals, we'd buy Guam bombs. We called them just like a piece of junk car, whatever oh, yeah, you know yeah. that you're just going to drive around Guam for a few for six months and then sell yeah. it to the next guy. So we bought our Guam bomb from some other team guys that were leaving. We had this. It was a, I think it was a 1977 Valare. It was beige. Yeah. But here's the thing: cars are kind of. You'd think cars would be like, oh. You don't really, you know, if you if you don't touch the controls, it's just kind of gonna go until it's just gonna go straight, straight until it like yeah. stops, right? Yeah. This car, I don't know what was wrong. <laughs> if you let your hands off the wheels, it would go into a full hard right turn <laughs> as hard as you could pop. You couldn't turn a car to the right as fast as this car would ca- turn, on, turn its on its own. <laughs> Guam bomb. That was our Guam bomb, the Volare. The vo- and also, for whatever reason, had hot. Scorching air, <laughs> you know, you know, you know the little like area underneath the back window on the yeah. old school cars. There's a little area. Yeah, yeah. Like you could maybe dash. Th- yeah, it's like a back dash. Yeah, you yeah. could throw like a a, a a pair of slippers up there or yeah, something. Yeah. Maybe a t-shirt or a sweatshirt. Right, yeah. it's a little area like that. And there can sometimes be aftermarket speakers be put in there, yes. right? Oh, yeah. But there was no, there was no aftermarket speakers. But there was just scorching <laughs> hot air <laughs> that came through those. There. I don't know. <laughs> it's like un, unknown source of massive heat yeah. would fire through that thing. 
Yeah. And so that car was kind of like a helicopter. If you just gripped your fingers off the controls for a second, yeah. you were hitting the right guardrail <laughs> in 0. 0.2 seconds. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, when do you get the impression, and, me, and you probably know this even firsthand, where just in Vietnam or in wartime, just in general, like just things are just loud. The, things are whole so loud. World things are so loud. much louder in real life than they are in the movies. Yeah. Which I know that's your reference. For instance, in a helicopter, you can't hear anything. Yeah, it's so insane. freaking loud. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It it's punishing on your ears. It's so loud in a helicopter. Yeah. The everything is louder. I mean, a Humvee is freaking loud. Yeah. Tanks are loud. Everything's loud. And everything's just vibrating. Yeah, everything's just vibrating. Just your whole world is <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. It's cool now we got those new uh, ear, uh, like, headsets, right, that block out loud noises. Yeah, yeah. The can- noise canceling. The, he said something about when the first, I, I think it was, like, the first time where he heard the um, the M60 mm-hmm. when, when he was and how it'd like vibrate the yeah. the thing. And that's what I was like, bro, the whole thing is just loud. No, the whole, your loud. whole world is just loud up there. Cause you got the helicopter, then you got um, the guns and everything's just vibrating it loud. Yep. It's like just a hostile. The other interesting thing is I think of Hueys, I think of Hueys as being old, yeah. right? In my mind, they're old. Cause I flew around on Hueys and they were old. Yes. Kind of like when you think of a bomber right now, like a World War II bomber, you think of this old, old yeah, yeah. you know? Hell yeah. Those were the most modern beasts of their time. He that was like getting Rolls on. Royce. That was like, yeah, to a Rolls Royce. Straight up. So, Well, um, listen, obviously, like I said at the end there, uh, guys like Major J. Tate set a great example for us on many levels. Courage. We, so. You know, like for sure. Uh, capability, 100%. I'm not sure what we're doing to improve our courage, but what can we do to improve our capabilities? Keep, Echo Charles. Capability. There's a softball for you. Knock it out of the park. <laughs> do me a favor. Capability. Hey, okay. We're working out. We're on the path. That's it. 100%. I used to say on the program, by the way. Yeah, we've I'm changed. on the program. You know how like when the- We're different now. Your wife comes home and it's like, oh yeah, like do you want uh, some extra cheese on the lasagna? You know, and mm-hmm. I said, no, 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 I'm on the program. So it's kind of like, okay, I understand, you know. Now you're on the path. But here's the thing. The path is more broad, more really? encompassing. Oh, okay. yeah, the program seems like you, you can easily be off the program in like three, four weeks or whatever, you know. Okay. It's like that kind of feeling. Yeah, okay. It's not They're not hard and fast rules, but I'm just saying the feeling is there. Let's put it this way. If you're on the path, it's a life thing. Yeah, it's like life. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. Programs are temporary. Yes. Somewhat. Yeah, okay, like cool. a temporary improvement, deviation, whatever. Either way, we're on the path. The good thing about the path is, sure, we have supplementation, but these are everyday supplementation. They're life supplementation elements. See what I'm saying? (laughs) So some of us, back in the day, we used to drink energy drinks. Junk energy drinks. Junk. Hey, it's a new new era of energy drinks. There's a new era of energy drinks now. Healthy energy drinks. The kind when you drink it, you get everything front end. You get everything you wanted. Energy. Then on the back end, you get everything that you didn't expect but want, yeah. health. And you don't get things that you didn't want, jitters, nope. diabetes, yep. uh, chemical disturbance inside your system. Some weird addiction. Addiction. Some weird inflammation all yeah. and all this weird stuff. Yeah, exactly Bunch of right. stuff we don't want. Yep, none of that. None, absolutely none. So, okay, so Jocko, Discipline, go. This is the energy drink, if you didn't know already. Some new flavors out which just adds to the choices you have. Hey, look, we all like orange. We all like orange. It's a staple, right? You're hard pressed to find someone who doesn't like orange flavor. True, yeah. Cool, but do we love orange? Maybe, Some people maybe do. Not. Maybe, I maybe Dave not. Does. I under, wait, good deal, Dave? Yeah. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Totally makes sense, but not all of us do. Some of us like more exotic flavors, like mango. Mango has the capability to be like, Love. I love mango. Yeah. Orange is more like, yeah, of course I like mango or okay. orange. See what I'm saying? What about the other end of the spectrum? Are people more like, well, mango is not really my thing. I'll drink orange, but mango is not my thing. It's possible. Just saying. 
you take one extreme, you're gonna probably end up with the other one as well. It's very possible. The nonetheless, hate relationship nonetheless, right we're we're adding to the the spectrum mm-hmm. of desirable flavors in discipline go. So now you got a win 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 situation for everybody. Three wins. Three wins. Okay. All day. Maybe even four later. I'm just saying, it's always improving. This is good. It's good. You're better off after you drink one of these. What you're about watermelon? Off. What about new watermelon? Whoop a, whoop a salt watermelon. Yeah. Same. Same. Here's the thi- I think that's closer to orange in terms of people it being a more broadly accepted flavor. Yeah. Watermelon. Yeah. Do you know anyone that does not like watermelon? I don't know anyone who does not like watermelon. Do you know anyone that does not like mango? Yes. See? <laughs> <laughs> Psychos. But yes, I do know some. Uh, either way, I get it. I get it. And to each their own. I, uh-huh. I can honestly say that with the, with the genuine. You kind of rolled the dice then with the mango. In a way, yeah. Actually, no, because when we chose the mango, I chose that because I personally like it, and mm-hmm. that's what Belittle kind of said. He said, "Hey, if it's you, if you like it, that's it." So I was like, "Cool, I like it." Right on. Well, well they seem to like uh, it. Drinks, too. energy drinks is what you were saying. You can get them. Yes, sir. It's they're a new era. Like I said, they're good for you. The thing is, that's a big deal, though. Like, yeah. come on, you'd be hard pressed pressed to find a good tasting energy drink that after you drink it, you're better off. It's good for you. 100%. You don't have to do a bunch of like health freaking recovery things after you drink energy. You don't go to go on a 14 day detox. Yeah, I know, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly right. All right. You know, I'm super low in calories too, by the way. Also, what else we got? Extra protein in the form of a dessert. Best tasting protein in the world, pretty much. You'd be hard pressed to find a better tasting protein with that the health nutrient profile that we have. The only thing that could possibly taste better as a protein is just steak itself. It's possible. <laughs> Very hard comparison. But even that, as we know, you can have a gorgeous, a gorgeous ribeye steak, yep. well marbled, tasty, cooked to a T. Seasoned to perfection. Seasoned to perfection. And you can still get done with that and be like, I want something to eat. You want eat. some milk, yeah. You want, exactly. some, you want some milk. Brad, that has been me actually for the uh, last four, three out of the last four days. 100%. Uh, that's interesting. Either way, these are all good things that will keep you on the path and front end and back end benefits 100%. There's nothing better than mulk. Honestly, there's nothing better than mulk when you get that little <laughs> get that you get that man. How's this? That so desire. Here's a okay, so mostly every <laughs> night the little routine. Mostly every night I'll eat a salad. Yeah. As a meal, like a big robust Chicken, it's a formula. It's, I'll give you the recipe some other time, but it's it's legitimate. Don't be talking to me about salad it's recipes. Bro, <laughs> I <kinda. laughs> I've seen yours. Yeah, I've seen yours. Okay. Um, either way, but, <laughs> but but I'll mix up a milk in there. In the salad? No, not in oh, the salad. Okay. With the salad. You know, you drink water or whatever you drink with salad, whatever. Yeah. For some reason, the milk with the salad is yeah, the perfect so combo good. right before bed. That's, so good. That's in my experience. Check. Either way, also we got other stuff too for immunity, for your joints. These are these are all things we don't want to worry about on the on this path. We don't want to worry about how strong our immune system is. We don't want to worry about our joints working or not working. We want to just be sure and be assured that like these the, things like are the, all the fire and forget missile. Exactly. You just right. push the button, boom, you're good. Hey, exactly joint right. warfare, super krill. Vitamin D three, cold water. You just yeah. they're fire and forget. Don't have to. You don't want to be thinking about your immunity system. You don't want to be thinking about your joints. If you, you want were, fire and forget, exactly right. If you're on these types of supplementation elements, there's only two times you're going to be thinking about this stuff. Is one when you get on them and they start working, or potentially if you accidentally get <laughs> off. That's the only two times you're going to think about this stuff. That's why I subscribe. Yes, subscribe. If you subscribe to these things, you won't go off of them. You won't have that miserable feeling, and you'll you we we you get shipping for free. Yeah, boom. So that's cool. Also, you can get the stuff at Wawa. You can get the drinks. You can get the the you you go into Wawa and you're like, oh, I need a little energy right now, yeah. but I don't want to crash and feel like crap in yeah. three hours. Cool, we got you covered. Go to Wawa. You can get these. You can also get all the stuff at Vitamin Shop as well. Also in the energy drinks, something I forgot to say, which I always know when I drink them, is there's electrolytes in it. Mm-hmm. Get a little yep. elevated The, the pre-workout levels. element in, in that is, yeah, it's, it's critical. Check. So yeah, also you can get them at jockofuel.com. That's where you can get everything, which is part of Origin, Origin USA. So Origin USA, what do they got there? American made jeans, boots, Jiu-jitsu stuff. Mm-hmm. And when I say American made, I don't mean just American finished. No. 
you know, you have grass fed yeah. and then whatever finish. It's not the whole thing. Grass fed corn finished or grain finished. Yeah, what whatever the deal is. No, origin's not like that. It's from the beginning all the way to the end. American finished. American started. And started. <laughs> yes, exactly right. Yeah. So boom, yes. So you got some good stuff. Pete's always making some new things. Innovative thing. Yeah, we got all you know, of it. work pants and the whatnot. Work pants are coming. I have a pair. I have two pairs actually. That's cool because I don't even have uh, <laughs> Delta freaking sixty eight jeans. Are you serious? I am very serious. Yeah. You got issues. Dude. I got the regular ones, which have been doing the job hundred yeah. percent. But you, you might know. want to try out those deltas. It's like you know what I hate to admit this. It's like the equivalent of a lightweight hoodie. Boom. Yeah, There's I'm a down time for that. And place for those Delta sixty eights. Oh yeah, for sure. Speaking of lightweight hoodies, we have lightweight hoodies. I'm going to come out with another one, I think, within the next three weeks um, where you can get these things. Okay, so Jocko has a store. It's called Jocko Store. We have lightweight hoodies. If you want to represent while we are on this path, you can get T-shirts. Like I said, hoodies, light and heavy, by the way. We've got some board shorts on there. Got some uh, some tank tops, you know, hats. Cool stuff on there. Representative of the path. Discipline equals freedom. Good. All these attitudes that we hope that we can run through the path with okay you're gonna represent jockostore.com we have a shirt subscription situation new design every month called mm. the shirt locker that one's been interesting people who see me part of the shirt even today even today will say hey i like that that last design i really liked it one guy said he wore it to church and everyone was talking to him about it Dang. literally i'm the nut. which design was that the, the the latest one what is the latest one so it just says check Oh, with a period <laughs> has the flag on the sleeve Check. too it's good it looks good but it's like you know there's some layers on there uh nonetheless yes so subscribe to that if you want one every month new de- different different types of designs um than the regular stuff but but good nonetheless and you can subscribe to this podcast and don't forget we also have jocko unraveling we have the grounded podcast we have the warrior kid podcast we also have the the jocko underground where we're Doing some alternative podcast talking about uh, stuff in the same vein, but maybe a little bit tributary mm-hmm. to the scenario that we're usually talking about. We're doing a bunch of Q and A. There's a place you can send Q and A, and we're getting through those. Uh, so go to JockoUnderground.com if you want to subscribe to that. It costs eight dollars and eighteen cents a month, and we're using that to create our own area where if we get booted off of the big platforms for whatever reason, or they just start interjecting ads. Is that cool? What it doesn't seem cool to me. You take this podcast, let's say they took this podcast today and you're in the middle of hearing about Lamb Psalm 719, and all of a sudden there's an advertisement on there for a mattress. Yeah, That's not cool. It's, it's not cool, no. So if you don't want that, cool, we got you. $8.18 a month. If you can't afford it, we still, look, if you can't afford that, cool, we got you as well. Go to assistance, or email assistance at jockounderground.com. We got you. Yep. Also, we have a YouTube channel. If you're wondering about the video version of this podcast, we do have a YouTube channel. Official. Got some excerpts on there and the whole episodes. Got some other enhanced episodes as well. Lots of explosions. I kind of minimize the explosions l- lately. But it just makes us feel like we're due for more explosions. So you bring up a good point. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, if there are explosions, that's where they're going to be. You should make a video where everything explodes. I'm about to because (laughs) of how much trash you guys talk to me about the explosion. Like, I'll make a regular video and people will be like, I'm uh, I'm gutted, literally gutted by the lack of explosions. I was like, man, all right. I agree with that person. Yeah, it was hard to disagree at the time. I mean, you know, are explosions appropriate at every single situation? Hmm, Maybe, maybe not. Nonetheless, if if the explosions are gonna be present, you're gonna find them on this YouTube channel along with everything else. So yeah, look up for that. Also, Psychological Warfare. If you don't know what that is, it's an album with tracks of Jocko. Each track is Jocko telling you how to get through a specific and general moment of weakness. So if you're in real <laughs> in real life, if you're having a moment of weakness, which we all do sometimes, but in this album, boom, Jocko will tell you why. You yeah. should, uh, you know, not succumb to the weakness. If you want a uh, visual representation of this stuff, go to flipsidecanvas.com. My brother Dakota Meyer selling all kinds of cool looking stuff that you can hang on your wall. 
We also have some books. Hey, the books I talked about today, Undaunted Courage is the series. There's three volumes out right now. Covered one, covered volume number one, which is an assault unit, an assault helicopter unit in Vietnam, 1969 to 1970. That's episode 275 of this podcast. Covered book three today, Lamson 719. Book two is called Medal of Honor. I'm sure we'll get to that book at, at some point. Um, you can pick up the series of books. They're just an incredible account that you have to read to really to really understand the kind of chaos that was going on. We have a new book, Final Spin. I have a new book, Final Spin. Mm-hmm. It is a, we don't really know what to call it. Literature. It is I'm, literature I'm of some kind. It. Yep. it could be a poem. It could be prose. <laughs> oh, it's prose. I don't know. There's some very poetic looking things in there. The way it's the way it's written. It's prose elements, I guess. Yeah, uh, you can check that out. You, you, you. It's it's available for pre order right now. I'm gonna say the publisher likely won't print enough because they're always looking to minimize any loss. They're looking to maximize profit. Okay, that's cool. They're running a company. I get it. They don't want to print too many copies and have some copies sitting around. So they're gonna minimize, they're they're lowballing it. So that what does that mean? To you, it means you end up with second edition against the will. Brutal, brutal. <laughs> and it's cool, but at some point you're gonna meet me. <laughs> gonna come for that. I'm not gonna say I'll sign your second edition, but I'm gonna know and you're gonna know yep. that you hesitated at the moment of truth. Don't let that be you. That's all I'm saying. Leadership strategy and tactics, field manual, code valuation protocols, discipline equals freedom, field, field manual, way the warrior kid, one, two, three, and four. Mikey and the Dragons, about face by Hackworth, and the OG of my books that I wrote with my brother Leif Babin, Extreme Ownership and Dichotomy of Leadership. Leif and I also have a leadership consultancy. It's called Echelon Front. Go to echelonfront.com if you want details on that. We have an online training academy. Go to extremeownership.com if you want to get training, if you want to ask me questions. I'm on there one, two, three times a week. We have a bunch of, of courses that you can take about these leadership principles, so check that out. We have a live event called The Muster. The next one is August 17th and 18th. I think we're almost sold out. We're getting there. Las Vegas, October 28th and 29th. So go to echelonfront.com and check events for that stuff. And if you want to help service members, active and retired, their families, their gold star families, check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got a charity organization where she helps out people from the military. If you want to donate or you want to get involved, go to americasmightywarriors.org. And if you want more of my protracted pronouncements or you need more of Echo's random ruminations, you can find us on the interwebs, on Twitter, on the gram, as Echo calls it, and on that Facebook. Echoes at Echo Charles. I'm at Jocko Willink. Thanks once again to Major J Tate for coming on today, sharing his experiences with us. But of course, and more important, thanks to J Tate for his courage and bravery in the service of our great nation. And to the rest of the military out there right now, currently serving with courage, thank you for protecting our way of life. And the same goes for our police and law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, border patrol, secret service, and all first responders, thank you for protecting us here at home and everyone else out there. Our lives that we're living right now are a gift. And our way of life that we enjoy It is also a gift, it's a blessing, and it's a luxury. It's a luxury that we get to be here in this world with freedom and free will and the opportunities that we have which were given to us through the bravery and sacrifice of others. Do not squander this gift. Don't waste these opportunities. Instead, go out there every day and get after it. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko. Out.